Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so I'm just going to provide a, a brief overview of uh, the history of, of oil and gas in the province and kind of where we're at currently. Uh, as well, I'm going to then move into talking about the uh, public discussion document itself, uh, really how it came to be, and uh, what are some of the uh, contents and components uh, that are in it. Um, well, uh, actually, New Brunswick, uh, a lot of people may not know, but New Brunswick actually had uh, quite a long history of oil and gas. Uh, it, it dates back to 1859 when uh, the first oil well was drilled in the province uh, near Dover. Uh, it's been a long history, but it's actually been a history of, uh, with very little development. Uh, to date, we've had uh, just over uh, 300 wells drilled in the province, and uh, Currently, we have uh, two producing fields. Uh, the McCulley Field, which was discovered in 2000, has 30 natural gas wells producing uh, near Sussex. And uh, the Stony Creek Field, which was discovered in 1909, currently has uh, 16 oil wells producing um, just in uh, Stony Creek, south of Moncton. And they're just indicated on the map here behind me. Um, as well, uh, horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing has also gone on in the province. Um, I've just mentioned a little bit about the uh, history and where we're currently at today, but I think it's also very important to recognize that uh, the shale gas industry is a fairly new industry. It started uh, back in the early 2000s in North America, and uh, this would be a, a certainly a different oil and gas industry than what New Brunswick has seen to date. Uh, with respect to the uh, stages of gas development and uh, really how a uh, oil or gas company would evaluate a jurisdiction, any jurisdiction for, for its uh, hydrocarbons, uh, it can really be broken down into six main stages. Um, and the first stage would be identification of the resource. So companies would typically use um, exploration techniques such as seismic and as well as the drilling of a few wells to actually see what the rock looks like and, and is there oil or gas actually in the rock. Once they've completed that uh, and they have found oil or gas, then they would move into stage two, which is the early evaluation drilling. Um, this stage usually comprises of drilling uh, a number of wells to actually find out uh, how deep is it and what's its geographical extent. So basically how big is the reservoir. Uh, once they've completed the, uh, that stage, then they would move into uh, stage three and four uh, pretty much together the pilot project drilling and uh, pilot uh, testing phases. So these two stages basically are kind of a, a mini commercial development. And it's all about finding out if the deposit is actually economically uh, viable for development. If uh, following the completion of those two stages, uh, the company finds out that deposit is economically viable, it would be at that point where they would make the decision to move into a commercial development stage, which uh, this stage could last anywhere from 10 to, to 30 years and beyond. It really just depends on the jurisdiction and the oil and gas itself. Um, following that, following the uh, commercial development stage, then it would enter into the final stage or stage six, which is project reclamation, uh, where, whereby the wells would be uh, decommissioned and the surface would be reclaimed back to whatever it was, uh, whether it was forested or grassland or what have you. Um, I've also noted on here uh, three of our companies. We have nine companies operating in the province, uh, but these are three of our more active companies. Uh, Swin Resources Canada would be aligned with the uh, stage one, or identification of the resource. They have yet to identify if there is petroleum in the areas that they're looking. Uh, as well, uh, Corridor, and Con Corridor Resources and Contact Exploration. Both have producing fields, but uh, again, very limited amounts of uh, production going on. So in terms of uh, our, our current regulatory framework, uh, behind me is a list of all the legislation that touches on the oil and gas industry in the province. And I really just want to focus on two of them. Uh, it's the Oil and Natural Gas Act and the Clean Environment Act. And, it, and it's under the Clean Environment Act where we find the phased uh, environmental impact assessment regulation, or, or uh, better known as, or more commonly known as the EIA regulation. Uh, and this uh, regulation is where we would actually see the majority of our recommendations to government, if, if the government accepted them, this is where they would be implemented from, uh, through EIA. Uh, just a little bit more about the phased uh, environmental impact assessment. As I just pointed out, we would do see this as a primary tool to regulate the industry. Uh, and it also has the ability to implement uh, site-specific 
uh, safeguards that are site-specific, yes, and also specific to the particular drilling activity that's going on. That's why it's called phase, so it moves with the project as it, as it continues through its lifespan. With respect to the uh, public discussion document itself, and you may have had an opportunity to pick up a copy, uh, there's copies at the back, um, it uh, contains technical and environmental components of all land-based oil and gas activity. Um, it's, uh, when we started developing the document, we quickly realized that if you want to talk about environmental protection, environmental components, and it was hard to get away from the technical components. So that's why a lot of uh, certain, some sections of the document can be quite technical in nature. Uh, it, it covers all stages from exploration right through to abandonment and reclamation, uh, and it builds on the existing regulations that I had pointed out earlier. Um, with respect to the development of the document, uh, it all began, I guess, last summer when we had our natural gas forum and June 23rd last year. We had stakeholders from across the province come together and we garnered a lot of uh, valuable information there, as well as we have uh, subject matter experts from across government, uh, uh, within the provincial government. Um, as well, uh, we did a cross-jurisdictional review in North America of uh, known oil and gas or, or major oil and gas jurisdictions across North America to look at what their regulations were and what, what, what's their best practices, as well as some 300 reports, critiques, and model standards that are developing and continue to develop uh, from industry, academia, and NGOs. The document itself is, is divided into 12 principles, uh, which uh, contain the 116 recommendations. And now I'm just going to quickly step through uh, 1 through 12 of the principles. Uh, principle one is geophysical or, or seismic testing. And this section really addresses uh, seismic testing, which is a, quite a common uh, exploration technique used by oil and gas companies. Uh, and it basically gives you a, an ultrasound image of the Earth down to a, a couple of kilometers. Uh, the recommendations within this section uh, ensure that this is done safely and in a manner that protects property and the environment. And such recommendations include enhanced setbacks uh, from seismic activities, as well as enhanced uh, seismic test hole drilling for the protection of surface waters and groundwater. Uh, section two is well bore integrity. And the, uh, this, this section is, is focused, focused, pardon me, on exactly that. Keeping the fluids and gases within the well bore where they belong. And this section contains the majority of the technical recommendations within the document. Uh, some of those recommendations include well casing design and actual uh, specifications for the casing itself, uh, as well as uh, well bore cementing and, uh, and design, uh, the standards around the cementing operations, and evaluations of that cementing to ensure that it's done properly. As well included is uh, pressure testing of the well bore to verify that integrity not just for the drilling operations, but also for the hydraulic fracturing operations to ensure that it can withstand the pressures exerted on it. Section three of the document is geological containment. Uh, and this, the recommendations in this section are all about ensuring that the hydraulic fracturing operation is contained within the target rock formation. So another way of putting that would be that the fractures are actually going where they're intended to be created. Um, the recommendations would include assessment of the geological containment ability of the reservoir rock. Uh, can I exert this uh, fracture treatment on this reservoir and the fractures will go where they're intended to go um, and before, before they do the operations. As well, uh, it includes the analysis of the rock formation post-stimulation or post-fracturing. So you told us what uh, you expected to happen and you modeled it. Now tell us what actually happened. What does it look like now? Section four um, is managing waste uh, at surface. Uh, where the last two sections really focused on uh, within the well bore and, and deep within the earth, uh, this section really focuses on all the surface activities uh, and addresses things like leaks, spills, and management of uh, waste and chemicals at surface. So the recommendations here would include well pad construction standards, things such as berms to control runoff, as well as impermeable liners on the well pads. Uh, also, uh, the use of closed loop systems for, for uh, waste fluid uh, management. So no open pits within uh, New Brunswick. We're suggesting that all wastewaters be contained within closed loops or, or steel containers. Uh, another recommendation, pardon me, uh, within a section is secondary containment of the storage tanks. So actually having uh, berms around the tanks themselves. 
Section 5 is uh, monitoring to protect water quality. And it's all about monitoring aimed at protecting surface water as well as groundwater. The recommendations include water well monitoring uh, for pre and post seismic activities as well as pre and post drilling activities of water wells. Um, not, just the water, uh, not just the sampling of the water wells themselves, but also monitoring of the oil and natural gas wells themselves to, to ensure that that wellbore integrity that I talked about in Section 2 is, is uh, still, uh, still there. Basically, you're monitoring for things such as corrosion, leaks, and, and monitoring the pressures within the well. Section 6 is sustainable use of water. And this, uh, this section is focused on water management uh, with respect to the oil and natural gas industry as a whole. Uh, the recommendations here include water recycling, uh, we've identified as the number one, uh, number one preferred method for controlling of wastewater. Uh, as well, uh, there's a water, uh, water use hierarchy proposed uh, in the document that basically uh, suggests that we use non-potable water first lastly potable water. So things like seawater and municipal uh, wastewaters would be used for industry before any fresh water would be used. Additionally, there's also water use uh, requirements for water use planning and reporting to be done by industry. Section 7 um, is about monitoring of air emissions and not air emissions just at the source but also at the receptor level, so where those air emissions may be felt. Um, there's also recommendations in this section for requirements for emission reduction plans uh, for oil and natural gas facilities. Section 8 uh, is aimed at planning for public safety and emergency response. Requirements in this section uh, are for industry to have security plans and emergency response plans in place. Section 9 is about protecting uh, communities and the environment. The rec recommendations within this section include setbacks from natural and cultural features such as uh, watercourses and wetlands as well as uh, dwellings. Also, there's recommendations in this section for noise and visual impact mitigation uh, and monitoring. As well, um, it's also a recommendation in this section for transportation. We have note that the uh, oil and natural gas industry is a transportation heavy industry. So included in this section are things like haul route planning uh, with respect to public safety. As well, uh, road use agreements uh, and, and that's really aimed at controlling road damage and having industry pay for that. Section 10 is about uh, reducing the um, financial risks and protecting landowner rights. This section addresses uh, financial securities and other ways of protecting landowners and New Brunswick taxpayers. Um, recommendations in this section include uh, property damage securities as well as well abandonment securities for the uh, oil and natural gas wells themselves. Um, there's also a water supply and uh, restoration and uh, replacement protocol within this section. And there's also things like ethical standards of conduct for land agent licensing uh, and standards. So land agents working on behalf of companies in the province would have to adhere to a code of ethics. Section 11 uh, is sharing of information. And this focuses on ensuring that all stakeholders uh, within the province have common access to info about uh, oil and natural gas activities going on in the province. Uh, recommendations in this include public disclosure of the environmental impact assessment data uh, in the language it was submitted by industry. As well, um, there's public disclosure of frac fluid additives and frac fluid chemicals used in their operations. Additionally, there's also notification radiuses for things like seismic activity and drilling operations to have uh, basically all stakeholders in the area informed of what is going on. Section 12 is about maintaining an effective regulatory framework. And this, uh, this section is really aimed at ensuring that we have a, a continuously improving set of rules for the oil and natural gas industry. And the recommendations in here, again, it's noted that the EI, EIA pardon me, regulation is noted as a regulatory tool. Um, as well, uh, we, we note that uh, the continuing uh, to gain uh, additional scientific information as, con as reports continually come out is, is really important. And going hand in hand with that is uh, really continuous improvement, the principle of continuous improvement and the flexibility to be able to implement uh, new standards uh, as, as they come out. 
Just switching gears here a little bit and on royalty and revenue sharing, uh, government has int introduced a profit sharing royalty that would see the province receive 40% of the profits of a shale gas industry at commercial development. Now, if we were to have a commercial development uh, of a shale gas industry in this province, it could be several years before we would see any significant pro uh, profits due to the high upfront costs of this industry. So that's also why uh, government is proposing that they maintain the current 10% revenue-based royalty that we have today. This would ensure that we continue to receive royalties uh, with 10% as a minimum. With respect to the uh, revenue sharing, government also announced a proposal for a revenue sharing structure that would see hosting landowners of oil and gas facilities receive half a percent and municipalities and uh, LSDs receive 2% uh, for uh, royalties for uh, operations within a 25 kilometer radius. Uh, this royalty paid to the hosting landowners and municipalities would be based on the volume of those producing wells. With respect to the administrative penalties, governments announced uh, stiffer penalties as well. Listed here is a, a list of the current and the new, new proposed and uh, uh, penalties. I don't really expect you to be able to read the list here, but basically under this new penalty structure, the, uh, the maximum penalty would now be $1 million, uh, which represents the strongest penalty in North America. And uh, this is just our contact information for our group, and uh, you can submit questions through there. And it'll be at this time, I'll just hand the microphone back over to my colleague, Mark Bellamo. Thank you very much, Craig. Um, I want to, uh, I always pull the, there we go. I always forget something uh, at these meetings. So I wanted to uh, mention your MLA, Jake Stewart, here. I wanted to recognize him, like Jake. And I believe your mayor. Is, your, is the mayor of Black Valley? There he back there. Hi, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for having us in your community. Um, just to give you a very brief rundown, again, of, uh, before we take questions and comments, I would ask that when you go to the microphone that you identify yourself and say where you're from. And if you're representing an association, we'd appreciate it if you'd let us know uh, which group you're representing. Uh, I'm going to act as the timekeeper. And uh, I don't want to be the bad guy, but uh, uh, it's been fine at other uh, meetings we've had. People are, are cognizant of the fact that many people want to speak. And uh, if at some point I ask you to focus your comments, it's not because I'm trying to be mean. I just uh, want to get everybody who wants to have a chance to speak, uh, uh, give them a chance to speak. Uh, I know some of our panel members have to travel later, so we have gone uh, quite a bit over in some um, instances. Tonight we're going to try to run a tight ship. So with that, I open up the floor to you, and you're more than welcome. Anybody wants to uh, come up and, and say a few words? Ms. Oland. Hi, Dr. LaPierre. My name is Vicki Oland. I live in Durham Bridge, outside of Fredericton. Uh, I wasn't able to go to the meeting there the night that you were there. I lived on the Miramichi. I've been living on the Miramichi. I've just recently moved away. I came here in 1981, and I left here at the end of 08. So that's like 25 years or something. Um, when I was here on the Miramichi, uh, my husband and I ran a, a salmon outfitting lodge. We took salmon fishermen and bird hunters. and. Um, at the time, in the early 80s, there was a huge crisis with the salmon numbers, and I know you are well aware of that, because I know you've been involved in these things over the years. Um, and we worked and worked and worked, and eventually, by 1984, uh, we had new salmon fishing regulations. We had to continue to work because the fishing, fish numbers kept dropping. We had various problems over the years. The fish numbers dropped right off, and then they came back. Over those years, we had a payroll of I don't know how many dollars, but I know we had as many as 14 people on our payroll. Uh, my husband was president of the New Brunswick Outfitters Association, and he was chairman of their uh, salmon outfitting committee. I very quickly in the early 80s became secretary and treasurer of the New Brunswick Salmon Council. 
Then I became president of the New Brunswick Salmon Council, and I held that position for five years. During that time, we held an event on the river. The river was the host, called Conclave 86. We had three, it was a conference for salmon fishermen, fishers, and uh, we had 396 guests. With a budget of $80,000, uh, we made a profit of $1,200, and our fishing success rate was 0.65, um, or maybe it was, I don't remember. Anyway, it was, it was unbelievably high because it was a great week. The reason I'm saying all this is to point out that the salmon fishery is an extremely valuable enterprise. Now, according to the recent Gardner Pinfold study, there are 637 jobs on the, direct jobs on the Miramichi River in the salmon fishery, which is worth $20 million a year. At the time that we were doing the work on the outfitting industry, uh, in the early 80s, uh, Dr. Twomey did a, an economic study uh, at my suggestion that was done. And uh, the salmon fishery then was uh, responsible for 1,500 jobs in rural areas in the province of New Brunswick. And I think at that time it was, uh, it was a lot more dollars. I can't remember the exact number. The reason we were able to be successful in our battle for salmon conservation was because what became apparent fairly quickly was that the sport fishery, which uh, was generating about 90% of the revenue from Atlantic salmon, was killing a very small number of Atlantic salmon. And the commercial fishery, which was generating very little revenue on Atlantic salmon, was killing 95 or so percent of the salmon. So it became apparent that if you, if you bring in a, uh, a, a release program for the large breeding fish and you have a healthy sport fishery and can kill the grills, which are the smaller fish, which aren't as valuable because any of the male fish, including par, can spawn a, a big female. Uh, so the reason we were successful was we, we applied economics and common sense to to a fishery which provided a lot of employment and a lot of direct revenues in rural areas, okay? The way I see things going, I see that Atlantic salmon industry, which was down and came back a bit and the fish went down, now the fish are back, the, the industries in flux, there are very few genuine outfitters left on the river. At the time, we were about 12. Um, the salmon fishery is again threatened. I know the river very, very well. I know all about the rain and the water levels. I know about the warm water and the shallow water and the brooks and the thunderstorms hitting the hot rocks on the beach and actually warming the river after a rain rather than cooling it off until you get into you know, a week of real rain. And I see this industry as a huge threat to the salmon fishery and to the Miramichi River, which is the largest producing Atlantic salmon river in the world with three million cubic meters of salmon habitat. Now, uh, I am dead against the shale gas industry in New Brunswick, and there are lots of reasons for that, and I'm not going to, to go, I am not going to go into great detail about them, because I know dozens of other people have done that so far in your travels. I know you've heard all the arguments about water pollution and air pollution, and methane escaping, and the fact that there are many distinguished scientists who say that because of the methane problem with the shale gas and fracking, uh, that shale gas is actually going to end up being more of a polluter than coal mining or coal burning. I know you've heard all about the potential health risks, actually, which apparently the government haven't looked into too much. So I'm, I'm going to tell you that I'm dead against it. I think it's very dangerous. I do not think that the government of New Brunswick has the moral right to make this decision without looking into it very seriously. Because you've heard it all, right? So I'm here to say something different. I'm here to tell you that I think the government of New Brunswick over the last year has proven to us, the citizens, 
that there is no way in the world they can properly manage this kind of, a, of an event. We have had so many problems dealing with government committees, with government meetings, dealing with ministers, dealing with civil servants, and dealing with people in the company. And I can give you a few examples. In June last year, when we had the protest at the Fredericton Inn, when they were having a meeting there, it was announced that, you know, New Brunswick's brought in the best regulations in the world. Come to find out, the regulations weren't even written yet. They were just a twinkle in somebody's eye. I went over to DNR to try to get them. Nobody was brave enough to tell me they weren't there. They weren't in place. We didn't find that out for months after they got all this publicity on having these wonderful regulations. At the Fredericton Inn that day when Northrop and Blaney came out to speak to the crowd, I went over and I asked them several questions. Like, don't you think we should do some more research before we do this? Why don't you talk to the other jurisdictions that have banned this and put on moratoriums? Because they've looked at it and seen the problems. Uh, Bruce Northrop said, well, we've looked at it. We've done the studying. We went on the trip. We talked to everybody. We know everything there is to know. We got a research place out behind my back door, out behind my house. Well, they don't know everything there is to know about it. And to me, that was an out and out lie. When I asked Margaret Ann Blaney, who was at the time Minister of Environment, um, did she understand about the water testing? This had become a big issue with us, water sampling. How was it done? I had called the Department of Environment and the Department of Health to say, you know, how are you going to do this water testing that they wanted us all to have before the seismic work? The guy said, well, you know, it's straightforward. I mean, you clean your tap, you take off the thing, you run some water, you run the water into the bottle, and you take it in, they test it, and here's what it has. So when I called him the next morning and asked him if he could send me that in writing, you know, in an email or something, he said, no, he couldn't do that. He was told he couldn't do that. He had to refer it on to somebody else. I said, what do you mean you have to refer it on? You just told me this yesterday. Uh, you know, wh why can't you just write down what you told me and send it to me in an email? I mean, realtors do it, doctors do it, public health people do it all the time. You know, this is how you take a water sample. Well, no, we have to develop our own protocol for the shale gas industry and the seismic testing. I don't know that that has yet been developed. They, they won't tell us now. They won't talk about the proper way to take a water test. When I went, uh, a few days later, I went to meet with people in the Department of Natural Resources and the Department of the Environment. And the woman sitting to your right there, Annie Daig, was in that meeting, herself and Paul Wilson, whose job is with environment, I think, and he is something like the director of well water source protection. When I explained to them that the people out where we were living were all upset about these strangers coming to the door, I call them the bozos. These are the land agents for the company. They were coming to people's houses totally unannounced, saying, you know, we're coming here to do this. We're going to sample your water, da 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 da. You know, people in the country, they don't want a stranger coming to their door and being aggressive with them about what they're going to do on your property. It just doesn't work right. When I explained this to Annie Daig and Paul Wilson, they agreed with me that this didn't sound quite proper. And they said, well, what do we do about it, Vicki? So I said, well, you know, you, you need to let the people know what's going on. How come we haven't heard anything about this from you? You know, you're the civil servants. You're the people here supposed to protect our environment and our water. And they said, well, yes, OK, so what should we do? I said, well, Swin, put a big ad in the paper. Why don't you take one? Oh, my god, we couldn't afford that, she said. You know, if the government can't put an ad in the paper to tell their citizens that they're going to be sending these bozos out to visit them, then how are they going to protect us from shale gas? OK? Then, oh, another meeting we had, uh, myself and some other people. Uh, we met with a bunch of people from the working group. I don't know if any of you were at that meeting or not. I can't remember. We were told that um, even though we'd been promised that all this, uh, this exploration and the test wells would be regulated and regu um, would be given conditions and they would be very carefully watched. Well, actually, because they got their permit in April and we didn't come up with these things until June, they kind of don't have to go by them because they were there before. Um, we didn't think much of that. The night we had a meeting in Taymouth and Tom Alexander was there and uh, Annie Daig was there and some other people. Uh, she, when we would ask questions of the civil servants, they would say, well, we don't know that. Well, we haven't studied that yet. Well, we haven't looked into that. Oh, well, we didn't know about this or that. And we had all this information, scientific studies from reputable people. 
They'd say, well, the EIA will take care of that. You don't have to worry. The EIA is going to protect us from everything. We come to find out the EIA is driven by uh, industry. The industry writes the EIA. The government has no say. It's up to the people to find the EIA, see what it says, and, uh, and then tell the company that we don't like it, we don't think it's good enough, we, want, we think this should be included. We can't go to the government and say, you're the Department of Environment. You're supposed to protect us and our waterways and our land and our air. They say the EIA is going to protect us. The EIA is written and, and finalized entirely by the industry. Anyway, I see people are getting upset and restless, and I'm going to stop now, but I could give you 25 more examples of the kind of thing. Oh, yeah, I got to tell you this one, Stantec. The private company that the government, or no, sorry, the private company that Swin have hired to do this water sampling. I called to ask them about the water sampling and about the protocol, and I said, what about us people out here who our wells have been damaged by road construction? When they were building the new Highway 8, our, our wells got grossly polluted, and luckily someone from the government caught them in the act, so DOT had to come good, and they installed UV lights and filter systems. There are about 15 of us, um, and it's an ongoing problem and an ongoing issue. So when I said to Shireen Ishmael, who was an engineer at Stantec, who's the project manager for this whole water testing thing for Seismic, she said, oh, well, I don't know anything about that. I said, well, gee, you're the project manager. I mean, OK, I'm getting upset. And when I talk to these people, I'm not uh, sarcastic with them like I'm being now, OK? I'm, I'm, I'm getting upset. I was very polite starting out. Anyway, so I'd say, um, well, you know, you're the project manager. Should you not know about this problem? And she said, well, I guess. She said, I'll look into it and call you back. So she called me back and she said, well, it doesn't really matter if you've got filters because what matters is what comes out of the tap, what you're drinking. I said, no, no, no. The water testing is supposed to be being done to see if the seismic testing is having any effect on our well. I said, I know that the, the filter systems mostly will protect us uh, from damage, but, but the issue is to find out what's happening in the well. Like, is the seismic affecting the wells? Could it be affecting the aquifers? All this kind of thing. I said, I want a better answer. So she calls me back with somebody with her. They say, well, the only thing that matters is the water coming out of the tap. I said, no, that's not what matters. You know, what matters is what's going on in the well. So then I said, and, and what's your plan for getting, for getting a water sample out of the well? Because what comes out of the tap has been filtered, so we want a true sample of what's come out of the well. Well, I don't know about that. I said, well, I think you better find out. You know, you're the project manager. Anyway, and then I asked her about um, biogenic versus thermogenic methane. And were they looking for it? What kind were they looking for? There's apparently only one place in Canada that does the testing to differentiate them. And I know you know all about it, so I won't go into the details. But when I asked her what the when I asked her about the test for the difference between the two and how you do all this, she said, there is no test. I said, pardon me? She said, there is no test for telling the difference. And Annie, I see you nodding your head. It's very distracting to me. I'm trying to talk to Dr. LaPierre. So if you could not do that, please. Anyway, she said, there is no test for the difference between biogenic and thermogenic methane. Well, what do you do when somebody like that lies outright to you or else doesn't know the answer? So those are the kinds of things we've been dealing with. And I think it's a very clear case of if the government can't set up a water testing program, if they don't have a way to tell their citizens this is coming, this is what's going on. You know, I have neighbors calling me practically in tears uh, about the way these people, these land agents, talk to them. What will they say, well, what if I don't want to do this? Well, you have to do it, and if you don't want to do it, that's too bad, because I'm going to come and do what I want anyway. So there's a lot, there's a lot of stuff going on, and uh, I don't like the way we're being treated, and I don't think it's appropriate, and I think this is way too dangerous, and the potential for damage is huge, because I think shale gas damage is not going to be fixable, fracking damage. I think it's not going to be fixable. fixable. And according to Dr. Michael Engrafia, and I know you're well aware of, of him and his work, and he says there is absolutely no doubt that at this time, with what we know, there is absolutely no way 
fracking and shale gas mining can be done this way because we don't know what's going on under there. We don't know the effects. We don't have the research. And my last comment is, uh, David Allward last week had a comment in the newspaper about all these people who got all caught up in the hysteria with the uh, romantic movie from Hollywood called Gasland and all their, you know, all their stupid things and everything. Well, the stupid things and the sensationalism he's talking about, these things happen to these people. The government of New Brunswick did not talk to these people when they went to visit them. There is a ton of research on the net done by reputable people and good universities that all say, like the EPA, et cetera, et cetera, you know, this stuff is dangerous, this stuff is problematic. I don't know how the government of New Brunswick can possibly consider going ahead with it. And I really, really hope that you will consider my comments and realize that there have been a lot of problems so far, and I'm sorry I'm not being very articulate, but when I started thinking about this this morning, I had a friggin' angina attack, so, so I'm gonna go sit down now, because it is that upsetting to that many people we just can't have it until they know what they're doing. That's it. Thank you. I'm just going to get uh, Annie to speak uh, quickly to a couple of the points. Just at the first. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your comments, uh, Vicky Um Just to clarify, a few questions um, or issues that were raised. Um, yes, the baseline testing requirements, so the water well testing requirements, um, the requirement for it was announced in June, but yes, that's correct that the sampling that was done last year uh, was planned prior to that new requirement, so it was done outside of those requirements, although the requirements, the protocol that is on the website, if anyone wants to see it, it is available on the government's website in terms of the baseline water well testing. Um, uh, Swin was doing it in accordance with what uh, we had planned anyway from a voluntary point of view. In terms of the gas analysis that was mentioned, the methane um, analysis, the biogenic versus thermogenic, um, that is the difference between sort of older gas, mature gas, which is the thermogenic stuff. Uh, that can be burned for fuel versus the biogenic, which is new or younger. Um, that analysis is done pre-drilling and post-drilling, but it's not required uh, pre-seismic testing, just to be clear on that. Okay, please go ahead. Good evening. I'm Colette Lacroix. I brought with me my grandson, Cédric, who is 11 years old, so we could know what's going on, what we're doing to Mother Earth and why maybe you won't be able to swim anymore. I also bought with me two collector's items. I would suggest you each get one. They give them out at the tourism. They won't be able to sell this province like this anymore. Whatever you see in these magazines that we paid very, a great amount of money for ain't going to be happening if this goes on. The Bay of Fund, they will not be globally voted Canada's top natural wonder. Nobody's going to come and visit New Brunswick because nobody wants to see mines and gas. I have a few questions and comments. Which responsible government would give permits to companies so that they can pollute millions of gallons of water with over 40 thousand to seven thousand gallons of different chemicals. I was sure to God it was against the law to pollute water. And now we're giving permissions to companies to come in and giving them permission to pollute water so that they can use that water to drill so that it can come up and be polluted and then we will transport it to Nova Scotia till we get organized and we can deal with that water. It would be better if we found a place to hide it. Concerning hide it, I wonder what happened to the spill site that the corridor spilled in Sussex area. That was in the paper on the June 12th. Everything was fine. They buried it under sand. It's liters and liters of radioactive material. If you bury it on the sand, does it disappear? Does it clean itself? Or does it go onto a water level? 
Well, we don't know because the experts aren't ready to answer that. Where will the gallons, the millions of gallons of water come from? Which lake, rivers will we deplete? Like I said, get your collector's item because there ain't going to be anything left. Clear cutting, five acres per site, five acres of clear cutting. Who is doing the study to see the impact on local surface, surface water, such as increased danger of flooding and erosion? We're all against clear cutting, but we're giving them permission to do it. Does the government have the manpower to check this on top of all they currently do? Who will cover the cost attached to such work? How can the government promote, in one hand, quality of life, and on the other hand, give out permits to run between 50 and 70 trucks an hour, seven days a week? How would you like to be sitting near that street? It's going to be yours. And if it's not yours, it's going to be the neighbors. What level of government will monitor and control the noise and pollution that a thousand of trucks will create? Who will control the truck traffic? And how will it affect the surrounding neighborhood? Can you just imagine sitting near a lake listening to the trucks going in and out? and in and out. Get your collector's item. How will safety be maintained on the road? Which level of government would do that? They're all poor. They're all crying they have no money. And all of a sudden, we have all this money. We can monitor everything. The water pollution, the air pollution, the noise pollution. Well, it's tremendous. I don't know. Somebody won a million somewhere. Who will pay for the increased manpower if it is needed to handle issues caused by excess traffic? What happens to the cost of road repairs if they exceed the amount put in as an escrow? How can a government give permission to pollute the air since when the well is in production, excessive gas are often released in the atmosphere or burned off? What are the requirements to notify the public? You know, before the government could do what they wanted. They controlled everything, the information. Now, with social media, ain't working, is it? In five minutes, you can communicate with anybody around the world and tell them the truth. So whatever you did before and put the veil in front of people, we ain't that stupid anymore. We can read, we can write, we can plug in the internet, and we can check the facts. And if you haven't done it, <laughs> and if you haven't done it, why don't you go and check what's going on in Pennsylvania? You so-called experts and your selective information that we paid for, because we paid for all these books, we paid for everything. We're paying for your trip here, we're paying for your food, for your climate, we're paying for everything, okay? I can talk. I'll tell you what, uh, we'll add a little if bit If you of want to monitor can, the meeting, you can stand. I can understand that there's, uh, there's uh, people, I don't have to be Kreskin to figure out that there's people here that are on both sides of the, of the coin. I and understand we'll be, that. We'll be, man, we'll be very respectful to everyone who gets up, and we hope that uh, if you have a comment, you can get up as well. No, not Thank a problem. You. The only thing I'm saying is I hope to God, my grandson, who's 11 year old, can be proud of our generation because we protected what we're borrowing from them. That's all. Did any panel members have any comments? There is a gentleman. Hey, did, did you, you want to get up and say just one second. Okay, that's fine. Um, Ma'am, you fixed Hi. the microphone for yourself? I think so. I moved okay. it down a little bit because right. I'm short. <laughs> yep. You're, I see you, though. Okay. okay. I'm Marcy Emberger, and I would have been at Dornbridge, but I was with my grandsons, and that was very important to me. I'm a semi-retired teacher, um, and I've spent most of my life helping students get good jobs 
I know how important jobs are. They are central to who we are as human beings. And so what I started to do was use the internet and research, as I used to tell my students, do your research. <laughs> and so I researched the jobs that the shale gas industry says it's bringing here. And I have five studies, and I know you guys probably have a huge amount to read, but I do have the study cited here, and I'll turn this into you. Um, here's some of the things that I found from my research. All five studies that I read have talked about how short-lived the jobs are. They start out big for the first year or two, because that's when most of the gas comes out of the earth. And this attracts a lot of foreign workers. Most locals are hired for truck driving, security, non-technical areas. And after a few years, those jobs and workers leave. And the few remaining jobs are very low level. This also means that any New Brunswick workers who do get the permanent gas field jobs will have to leave New Brunswick because they're going to have to follow the de next development area. This isn't an industry that brings our kids home to stay, which I think is important to all of us. Maybe this is common knowledge from everybody in this room, but it was something that I found really interesting. Um, one of the studies that I read was from New Mexico, and it talks about the concept of um, boom and bust that goes on in the shale gas industry. This is a quote. This it has not been a source of economic stability or growth. Instead, the, it has contributed to a downward cycle of boom and bust. Natural gas development does not provide substantial jobs and income for local residents, even when it is carried out on a massive scale. Now, I've read a lot about boom and bust economies, and it's been studied for a long time, and it seems that shale gas is even the worst because it's of its extreme short lifespan. At the very least, these studies showed some arguments against believing the economic promises that the industry has made to all of us including teachers like me. Here are some of the details that I found. One study was entitled, Fossil Fuel Extraction as a, Center, as a County Economic Development Strategy. Are energy focusing counties benefiting? This study looked at 26 rural counties that had significant shale gas development and 254 counties that were similar in size but didn't have the development. And the study concluded, quote, counties that have focused on energy development are underperforming economically compared to poor counties that have little or no energy development. Energy-focused counties over a long term have less economic diversity and resilience and less ability to attract investment and retirement dollars. This shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody in any other industries because they can't find employees or a good quality of life where shale gas is being developed. They're faced, other industries are faced with high costs of everything from food to living quarters to supplies. Likewise, a shale gas environment is no place for retirees for health and financial reasons. The area becomes totally dependent on shale gas. These counties also have lower levels of education. Students drop out of schools and, schools and choose not to continue their education because they can make quick money in the gas industry. Once the industry moves on, these kids have no other job skills and there's no educated workforce. These areas develop a greater gap between the high and low income households and a growing wage disparity between energy related workers and other workers. Because gas jobs will pay more than local businesses, community diversity suffers as economic di disparity increases. Businesses not connected to shale gas will not be able to find employees, while those that are service gas industry, those that service the industry, prosper temporarily. Everyone else sees their cost of living go through the roof. The immigrant workers will affect the laws of supply and demand and greatly increase the cost of everything, particularly housing and food. 
This means that people making normal wages on, or people on fixed incomes or pensions will either struggle to get by or have to relocate. Even those people who provide services like hotels, restaurants, they, they're going to have something for the big boom and it will expand their businesses. But once the industry leaves, they're stuck with the cost of maintenance and depths for infrastructure that's no longer needed. Last study quote. The problem is that most communities are distracted by the short-term gains, which brings me to my observation from my research. One study says that the only chance that communities have of surviving is to do detailed planning before the industry even begins. It, there has to be advanced planning, which we have not seen yet in this province. And in the recommendations which I trudged through, sorry, they don't even address any of the social problems. Social problems like, these are some of the things that were listed in the studies that I read. Besides the direct negative economic effects, communities will face increased homelessness, displaced people, violent crime, drug abuse, numbers of calls for emergency workers. These are not suppositions, but they're facts supported by the history of every shale gas community I read about. Along with the fact that we have no report on public health concerns, the lack of concerns over the social impacts in this rec these recommendations is alarming. And finally, my question is, how and when will the government address these concerns, social issue concerns? Thank you very much. I can certainly, I can uh, touch very briefly on that. Uh, back last year, uh, a year ago, a few days ago, actually, uh, the government put out a, uh, a framework which included a community resource plan and a health uh, protection plan and safety plan. What we've come out with here are, are related mostly to the environment and protecting wells and wellhead integrity and so on. But there's, we're years out before even knowing if there is a resource and if it can be, uh, can take off in New Brunswick. But those, I assure you, I know you're looking at me uh, with skepticism, thank you very much. I, I'd expect nothing less uh, from a teacher than such a, a nice answer. Uh, but it is part of the framework, I assure you. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to let this gentleman speak, please. Hi, I'm David Dunahoo. I'm a, I was a local plumber, entrepreneur. I'm a pipe fitter. I work out west a lot. And I'm familiar with shale gas and the gas industry. And familiar with Vicki Olson. I worked at her uh, camp facilities different times. And I didn't see her concern for the environment then when she had inadequate uh, septic systems. But anyway, um, I was. <laughs> but I would like to challenge anybody here to uh, ask a neighbor, a cousin, a friend down the road, because everybody in the Brunswick knows somebody out west working in this gas business and uh, making a good damn good living at it. And the uh, people out there, they're not worried about getting their unemployment or EI for the winter. They're worrying about what they're, what they're going to invest their profit in, their money in. Anyway, uh, and Alberta is abundant in wildlife and fishing, and I believe there's approximately 237,000 gas wells fracked in Alberta, and not one proven case of well water contamination. And there's been so many lies and so many half-truths told by the nay side about the taps being on fire and well casings, you know, being um, uh, giving off methane. Uh, it's it's 10,000 feet in the ground. And as a plumber, I know good water is 300, 400, 500 feet in the ground. And after that there, uh, you know, it, it's almost untreatable. So when, you're, when you get a 9,000 foot barrier protection, when they frack approximately 150 feet to 200 feet, uh, it's myth and fear mongering uh, rampant. And I know uh, environmentalists make a lot of money off and get lots of large contributions from it. But anyway, uh, that's my thought. Alberta is prospering. Saskatchewan is prospering, and I hope New Brunswick will prosper soon. Thank you for those comments. And I should uh, uh, clarify that occasionally somebody will come to the mic and say something that requires no comment from us, and that's probably when it's a statement, and uh, unless anybody wants to chime. 
Sir? Hi, uh, my name is Joe. I'm from Pontiac. Uh, I've heard most of the group that's here tonight over and over and over. And um, I side right with them. I feel the same way as they do. And I want to thank the panel for being here. It's, uh, I don't think there should be any snickering going on about the panel or the people that are sitting around trying to ask questions. And I've been out to a couple of these and I've heard a lot of uh, questions. Uh, there weren't really questions. There were people telling already this research that they have done and that's what they were putting out. I would like to hear from the people from Blackville to come up and give the positives why they think this is a good industry because this is their community and I heard they, they are more than for this. So I'd like to hear some of those people come up tonight and uh, let us know why they think they, that this is a good industry. Thank you. Okay, that's absolutely fine. Um, and, and again, thank you for being very succinct. Uh, the, the microphones are open if anybody wants to, uh, to go up. I'm Ann Creamer and I live in Derby Junction. And I have some questions that I'd like to have some answers to. Sure. You have to bear with me, I don't have a desk. Number 10. Number 10 deals with the financial risks to landowners. Now you state here that you, uh, the amount of the security for property damage has been set at $100,000 per licensee and leasee, plus a dollar per hectare. Is that per company or per well? That's per company. Could a company so, have 100 wells? Yeah. For, for example, uh, the Swin Holdings, uh, in terms of the, the, they have a, a license to search. They don't have any leases yet. Uh, the, the amount of that damage security would be on the order of, what is it, Craig? About a million dollars, I believe, for, for that one, one holding. No, but the deposit they make is 100000 for all their wells, plus the dollar a hectare. Now that? Yeah, sorry. Um, no, uh, for the wells, uh, that would fall under the, uh, if, if a company was to drill a well, they would have to put a well bond abandonment uh, with Department of Natural Resources, which uh, the that's, figures. That's item 10-3. Yeah. I'm, up, I'm talking 10-1. Okay. Uh, that's the $100,000. Is that per, for all the wells of each company? That's, that's $100,000. Um, plus a uh, dollar per hectare for their, for their land. So right. it would be, in, in the case of Swin, as Dave was pointing out, it would be right. about $1.1 uh, million. But to talk about the, the well abandonment security, that, that's, if you're going to be talking about the oil and natural gas wells themselves. I'm not talking 10-3. That's, that, that's a separate uh, Right, that's 10-3. I'm talking 10-1. I'm saying does Swin have, a, let's say they have, they pay $100,000 for their license. That's that the deposit? $100,000 plus a uh, dollar per hectare. Right. Uh, and that's for, if they have a license that they can put 100 wells on, that's what their deposit is, $100,000. That's for the exploration, yeah, but then it's plus 10.3, 10, 10 as you pointed out, on which top is, of that. That's, that's the abandoned one, which is different. That's correct. Right. So, that $100,000 is to be used if there is any problems for replacement or restoration of water dealing with the quality and capacity of your well. What if you have 20 wells affected? Yeah. Um, in terms of the financial security, I think the way we've set it up, there's a number of different overlapping secure. Sorry. Um, in terms of the financial securities, there's a, a number of overlapping securities that all would come into play. So to talk about one in isolation may, may not be completely... Uh, people there's, exactly well, right. there's, there's the three. There's the, the well, damage, there's I the I abandonment, and there's a liability insurance. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And that's it. Well, that's all that's in this one. Well, what it is, the financial security for damage you, we've talked about. Right. 
The enhanced well abandoned security is for abandonment. Uh, mandatory liability insurance is a, is a new recommendation from us that oil and gas companies would have to have liability insurance. There's uh, an orphan petroleum sites fund recommendation. There's an environmental contingency fund recommendation. Um, and that's, that's sort of the framework of, of the okay. contingencies I'm, that we're I'm dealing with the landowners near the wells. Right. Okay. Now, what so. if there is a problem and the water is replaced or restored? Is replaced, let's say, with something. What about the value of the landowner's property? What if it decreases because of the problems? Where is that recovered by the landowner? Well, if you're talking the water supply replacement protocol, mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the aim there would be to restore or replace the water supply. So right. if, if the well was contaminated, it would be replaced. And that, that is the, the purpose of the, of the protocol. So if so they dig another well and there's problems well, with it? Well, there, there are a number of ways that that could be done. But what, are they, what are they? Well, one of them would be to replace the water well. One of them would be a, a local communal water supply, for example, where you would service a number of dwellings from a single well. Um, I don't know, Annie, can you think of any others? Or? Distribution system yeah, distribution. larger distribution system. And if we got to so do you think, in your opinion, that if this happened and there was damage in the water supply, these possibly more than 10 or 15 people, mm -hmm. that there would be any uh, decrease in value of their properties? Well, I suppose if the water supply were replaced, right. then... So where, where do they have access? What do they have access to the landowners to recover that loss of money? Uh, loss of money in terms of if the water the value, supply were no, replaced. The loss of money re, re the value of their property. If you're in a fracking area, I can pretty well guarantee you if your house is in a fracking area, even the realtors are going to have to dis disclose that if they have the property for sale. Hmm. So if there is damage, water has been contaminated, there could possibly be damage to the landowner in the value of their property. Yeah. Their house goes from $100,000 to $50,000 because that's all they can sell it for. Where do they recover the $50,000? Well, if the damage is restored, I guess I don't see where the, the property damage I'm or the, the decrease in property value would occur. I'm talking a situation that the damage is, does exist. Does exist. Yes. It would have to be restored. It would have to be rectified. So they would be, what would you do, move them if there was, like I'm, I'm saying, yeah. who's going to look after the landowner? Well, I mean, in terms of their Because $100,000 isn't going to go anywhere. Well, it's not $100,000. As you know, it's plus, plus per hectare. So it would be a fund of about a million dollars in Swin's case. In addition, we want to make sure that there's mandatory liability insurance in place with an environmental... So would they have access to the company's liability insurance? They have to have liability insurance. So we, we would set the minimum amount that they so would the have. So the landowner have. would have to sue the company under the, their well, liability insurance? Not, no. <laughs> That's why we put the replacement protocol in place and the damage security. So they wouldn't have to. In fact, other jurisdictions, the problems they had was that, no, landowners don't have the resources to go after an oil company, to hire a consultant, to take them to court, and all that kind of stuff. So in terms of the water supply replacement protocol, the idea is that government would already have that money in hand. And if the, the gas companies would be set, we would tell them, you know, it's up to you to replace it. If they refused, government would do it at their expense. So at the, and off the hundred thousand dollars, take deducted off the, the hundred thousand dollars. dollars. Okay, so you're saying to me that there would be no decrease in value of property. Uh, the royalties. I'm confused on your on your. Examples of potential revenue sharing. Um, you view the prices of $3.20 and $8.75 per million cubic feet. Is that correct? Per million cubic feet? I can answer that. Yes, that is correct. There's a gentleman here who can answer that. And those models were done based on the fact that while there's bargain basement prices for gas now, they're probably not going to stay at the basement three, four, or five years out. So it's three dollars and twenty cents per million cubic feet. That's correct. Or, uh, or sorry, just uh, it's per thousand. Per thousand, or sorry. Million BTU. Okay. That says million. Per, it says per million here. So that's million BTU. Million, million BTU. 
So it's per thousand cubic feet. That's correct. Okay. Because they're they're only making twenty five dollars a day if you if you do it that way. Okay. So you've used three dollars and twenty cents and eight dollars and seventy five cents to come up with your revenue sharing and your uh, land own sharing and the business uh, LSDs. Uh, can the public have access to your uh, parameters? All the other assumptions you made? We can, we can uh, get people who want the whole modeling of the assumptions absolutely leave us your information. I can, we'll I'll get you in touch with the I, Department of Finance. I'd like, to have, I'd like to have what your assumptions were for costing, what your assumptions sure. were for to, for, to uh, see where you come up with these figures. Yeah, so absolutely. I'll, I'll give you my name. Yep. Did you have other question? Yep. Talk amongst yourselves. The articles, the gas studies and lessons learned. Did you get any industry responses to these? I see that you've, you, you did, I will commend you on this one because you did cite cases, and I think that you personally believe that there was problems. Um, did, but what was the industry response to these problems? Did you find them satisfactory, or did you find them uh, unsatisfactory? And that's all I have. So if you can answer that, I'll sit down. OK. Thank you uh, for your questions. It would be helpful if, if you could pick a particular example. Um, there are several case studies in here. I guess in general, sorry, go ahead. I think number one is the one that I believe right. the, the company, the oil industry, uh, denied that problem. Yeah. I think you're talking about Pavilion, Wyoming, where there's uh, ongoing, I should say, the studies are still ongoing. US EPA found uh, evidence of hydraulic fracture fluid in shallow groundwater. Industry has disputed that. Um, we took the, the, the stance that, in fact, we believed it, it may well have been frac fluid in the water. So we wanted to know why, how it got in there. So, so we reviewed uh, not only the US EPA study, we reviewed a, a US Congress study that, and again, I think the reference is in the document as to why and what happened. And that study told us that Pavilion Wyoming, there were several things that they, we, they may have done wrong, and I didn't want to, but it seemed that they didn't put something called the well surface casing deep enough. What that means is they didn't extend the cement and steel to the full depth of the shallow groundwater, uh, which is what we're proposing here. They also used uh, open pits, excavations in the ground for storing flow back water, which is the spent fracking fluid. So we decided we weren't going to allow that in New Brunswick either. So we would have something called a closed loop system. Everything has to be closed to the atmosphere and contained in tanks. The other thing they did note, the researchers did note, that the gas in that area of Wyoming is very shallow. It's almost in a, in a sand layer. And uh, it, the geology, and I just quote what they said, the geology is atypical, sorry, atypical of, uh, of uh, shale gas deposits elsewhere. So those were some of the factors that they had brought forward. So we were recommending the ones we could control. I mean, our shale gas, I believe, and uh, Craig can correct me if I'm wrong, it's about two and a half kilometers down, first of all. We can certainly address the, the surface casing issue, and we could certainly address the, uh, the pits and the flow back issue. So that's what we did. Thank you, Dave, and thank you for your questions. And if you leave us your contact information, we'll, we'll certainly get you in touch with someone at the Department of Finance. Um, would you like to speak? You can move the microphone. It's awfully close to you there. If you wanted to just move it right over, it's not attached to any wires. So here you go. Okay. My name is Flinke Welte. I live in Durham Bridge. I uh, could not uh, hear the whole session last time. So uh, I do not want to go in any details here because I think all of us know what's going on, pro and contra. What I want to say to the issue before of the value of the property, who in his right mind will buy a property in the middle of a fragland? Can you please tell me that? I talk to you here, you five people. Would you like to buy and live in an environment what we have seen on that section or on that uh, pictures? Would you like that? I think you will not find anybody who will buy one single property 
That's the one thing. We do not even have to talk about the value. It will be not be for sale anymore. Nobody will buy it. My, I'm called what the people today do, the younger one. I belong to the baby boomers. I don't know what I should say about that. Is it something good or bad? I just know it's a burden right now to every each government. We have been the people who built up that country that it looks like how it looks today. We have worked, and I talk about myself right now, for 40 years, buying a house, paying for it, working every single day until today, and I'm far by 60s. I could go on, on a, a pension. I'm not doing it because I have my whole entire life worked for myself each and every day of my day. I'm self-employed. I work alone. I don't need anybody to do the work for me. That is my livelihood. And that livelihood will be taken over. I do not know by whom. Industry, interests, I don't know. So, what is left for me? That, I don't get a big pension. That is my life. That's my retirement. The first time in my life I will go when that thing here comes to the government and say, here I am. I need some money from you guys because I do not have even water or soil or something anymore here. And the noise, I'm not accepting that, sitting in an environment with thousands of trucks going by. I'm just not, it's my pride. I'm not doing this. So, the other thing. There's nothing to laugh about. You will sit in that situation 30 years ago, and some government comes, a totally new one, and will tell you they take away what you have worked for. There is nothing to laugh about. And the other thing, what I want to say is, here, whatever, says there are also sections. Where is the section to evacuate the people who live here? who do not want to live. There should be an evacuation program because it is sold to the industry or not to us anymore. How can you just dare to put such an industry in a valley where people live? It's outrageous. It's impossible. No one in his right mind will ever do this. Shame on the government. Well, thank you for those comments. I can assure you nobody was laughing um, at the, those comments. If, if. Sir? Uh, my name is Matthew Sturgeon. I, um, I'm a high school teacher in Chatham, and I'm a deputy mayor of this village, but representing myself. Um, and I want to be very sure to, to let everybody know that uh, I don't want to discredit anybody's opinions about any of the, any of the, the uh, things that anybody's saying right here tonight. Everybody's entitled to their opinion about this, these circumstances, and I don't want to make sure that my, uh, my opinion doesn't discredit anybody else's. But uh, it seems to me, and I have two points to make, the first being that it seems that a lot of the people on the nay side of this argument um, have been able to live in this province up until now and make a living at some of the natural resources that we've had in the past, talking about lumbering forestry and, and the salmon fisheries, some of those natural resources that uh, at this point talking about lumber is not really relevant uh, in the province anymore. Um, for speaking on, on my own behalf, I'm 23 years old, um, and I would like to be given the opportunity to make my own livelihood within this province based on some of the new natural resources that are going to be available to the province. And the other point that I have to make is that, um, speaking on property value, if you... Uh, <laughs> do me the favor of asking anybody that you know living in Fort McMurray right now what the value of their property is, I think you'd be sorely, sorely surprised by what we're paying around here. Thank you. Thank you, sir. 
You might win the prize for the shortest comment. This will probably be a runner-up. Well, oh, there you go. Good evening panel, Dr. LaPierre. Can you just step a little closer to the mic? A microphone? little bit closer. How's that? That's beautiful. My name's Alan Harper. I currently live in the Lincoln area, just outside Fredericton, after my tenure in the military of over 30 years. I'm originally from the Penobscot area, a little village on the outside of it. Lived there all my life. My family lives there. Many acquaintances live there. I came up from there today because I'm down there on vacation. I don't know if many of you have been in that area. There's been a lot of stories come out of that place. Some are trying to paint a picture of Dimmick, Pennsylvania out of it. I have friends in Dimmick as well. I just would like you to know that the history in that area, what is going on, what is being exaggerated perhaps in some cases, has been going on for a hundred years. There have been some substance issues, perhaps associated with the potash mine. That seems to be our general consensus in that area. Underground mining, we can look at Spring Hill, Nova Scotia, and see what has happened there. Eh, pretty much predict predictable. Having said that, substance has also been an issue there for a hundred years. Some of you may recall a place called the Mystery Crater that was on Route 114. Substance. Water, yes, they did lose their water, a number of the residents there. I sympathize with them, and it took a little bit, but now they have good water. Year-round, even in dry spells. No more lugging water from the Springdale Spring on Route 114 on the Fundy Park Road. They can turn their tap on and get it. Uh, there's been some talk of lower property values. There's been a lot of building up around the Penobscot area lately. I see uh, within 300 meters of Macaulay 1 and 2, about a five acre vegetable farm in its second year of very prosperous production. It's within half a kilometer of the PCS mine in that devastated area. They are thriving. New businesses have moved in there. I was to one of these things here a couple weeks ago and it was stated that a a resident had to sell their home at half the assessed property value. Uh, I have some kept contacts around. You can access a database and see what goes on with properties, as I'm sure you can, panel. That house actually sold for more than twice the assessed property value in ground zero in the devastation. So. There's been a lot of talk, there's been a lot of discussion, there's been a lot of information for both sides of the issue. I trust the panel will look at some of the facts that have come out over the past few months, some of the findings, US-based, that's where all the horror stories come from. Being around the Penobscot area, I have toured inside the wire many of the wells, the compressor station, and the processing plant. And I assure you, with my training as a nuclear, biological, and chemical safety officer, using a gas detection meter, there are no leaks. There is no poisonous odors or gases in the area. It would behoove them not to have that. They're selling a product. If you can compare it with the maple syrup industry, for instance, do you want your product running onto the ground? Probably not. It's a good thing to send it to market. So, please look at the other side of the story. What the facts are. What recent findings have discovered. Some folks I know in Dimmick, Pennsylvania are going through a, di a very difficult time now trying to right the wrongs that their community was turned into a devastated wasteland. Not the case at all. Not the case at all. Within the last six hours, I've been talking with six of them. They say, tell your people the facts have been distorted here. It's not as it appears. And don't let it happen. Don't let the facts be twisted. Tell the truth. And I encourage you, panel, all of you, some of you may have been there already, visit, see for yourselves 
hold a gas meter in your hand by a wellhead and see what comes up. It'll be all zeros, guaranteed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for those comments. Sir. Uh, good evening, Dr. Uh, LaPierre. I have a, a list of references that I'll give to you after I um, uh, say a few words and ask my question. Could you identify yourself, please? Uh, my name is Mark Darcy. I'm from Fredericton, New Brunswick. And uh, Dr. Uh, LaPierre was almost um, three weeks ago in, in Chipman uh, that we were asking um, if Fredericton and Moncton and other cities would be included in the uh, tour, the public engagement tour. And do you have an answer now for the residents in Fredericton and Moncton especially that would like to be part of this? I have an answer for that. We, uh, we have that under consideration and we don't, uh, we ha we don't have a decision on that yet. And when will a decision be made? I'm unsure, sir. Because the deadline for submissions is coming up. Point taken. Right, in terms of um, evidence-based um, facts, uh, people have done their homework. Um, people are very informed. Uh, I would note that many of the references used um, in your own um, determination for re recommendations on regulations uh, exclude many of the recent uh, reports that have come out. And uh, specifically, um, ProPublica uh, has been doing a number of very extensive investigative reporting on fracking. And there is only one reference um, past 2009 from ProPublica in the list of your references. And it has nothing to do with water contamination. Um, it has uh, something about baseline. But uh, it's problematic that the re that references you're using are not up to date and they seem to be cherry picking uh, certain uh, publications. That's, I have a real problem with that. Let's look at just well integrity for, for example. It doesn't matter that the fracking is taking place two kilometers or more under the ground. The fact of the matter is that you have punched a hole. You have a vertical shaft traveling down through your groundwater, your aquifers, to that depth. And so uh, what has been the, the record in the industry? Would you get on a plane if you had a 1 in 20 chance of crashing? That's the immediate failure rate that the industry data itself shows. And it gets worse than that. In, in 10 years' time, 30% of the wells fail. After 20 years, 50% of these wells will fail. And there is no amount of regulations that will change the laws of physics, chemistry, and geology, which the present technology is up against. We have an inherent problem in this industry, and it's impossible to have an acceptable integrity of the well casing pipes and joints. Let's just look at the facts. In number one, in the Pennsylvania DEP compliance database, violations for methane migration. In 2010, 1,400 wells drilled. 90 of them failed, were fined for violations of methane migration that traveled up the shaft and were able to be measured um, at the surface. That's a 6.2% failure rate. Let's move to 2011 in Pennsylvania. 1,900 wells were drilled. 121 were found to be violations of the methane migration. That's also a 6.2% rate of failure. And the first two months in 2012, 
19 wells failed out of 262. That's a 7.2 rate of failure. So let's look at um, number two, U.S. Mineral Management Service in the States. Rafato and all in Oil Field Review, 2003. 30 years of data analyzed and it proved that we have an immediate 5% failure rate and um, in, 50, in 20 years time, 50% of the wells fail their integrity. Worldwide, number three, worldwide, there are 19% of wells leaking. And this is from the industry's own data, Archer Wells Services. In Australia, 44% of all wells are leaking. In North Sea, there are 482 wells. 18% of these wells are leaking. In the United States, there are 200,000 wells. 16.7% are leaking. One of these wells, where the concrete casing uh, failed, of course, is the British Petroleum um, Well in the Gulf of Mexico, which caused a devastating um, a pollution in that area. Can we and address a couple of those things? I know some of our, our panelists wanted to make comment. Can I do that now, or are you almost done? Uh, just, uh, I'll just um, review. Do you, just do you want to wrap more? up? Sure. Uh, Dr. Can Conrad Volz, uh, University of Pittsburgh. Uh, I think we lose sight of the fact that there are tens of thousands of leaking wells in North America. When cement shrinks, it pulls away from the geological layer that it's sealed from. So we have two problems. The, we have a deterioration of the cement, sometimes of the steel, um, but we also have a shrinkage, a natural shrinkage of the cement um, from this vertical shaft. And Dr. Volz was asked, even if it's a couple of miles? And he answered, of course. Uh, also, we have well integrity study Canadian data of 350,000 Canadian oil and gas wells. The failure rate, again, varies with the age of the well, and we see consistently with the United uh, States Minerals Management Service. And now, just recently, um, it just came out June 21st, 2012, and it's in ProPublica again. And it was also cross-referenced in Scientific American. Uh, are fracking wastewater wells poisoning the ground beneath our feet? I'll be very brief. Quote, in 10 to 100 years, we are going to find out that most of our groundwater is polluted, unquote, said Mario Salazar, an engineer who worked for 25 years as a technical expert with the EPA's underground injection program in Washington. It turns out that injection wells themselves, some of the wells are designed to have deep well injection of toxic materials held in the deep geology and not to come back up. It turns out that those deep injection wells are now leaking. And uh, the gentleman goes on, Mario Salazar, uh, his final comment, he says, quote, a lot of people are going to get sick, and a lot of people may die. And this is pretty troubling. So in terms of um, the well integrity, it doesn't matter what's happening two, two and a half kilometers down. You have these vertical shafts. You have a well casing integrity problem, which is inherent in this technology. And um, I'm wondering, as chairperson, do you have, after listening to all of the public comments, and you've certainly heard a lot of um, similar comments about how the regu regulations are not going to protect human health and the environment, do you have a mandate, as the chairperson, to put forward a recommendation to the government to impose a moratorium or a ban on shale gas? until such time when the industry um, is able to rectify these well casing integrity problems. Thank you.
So there are, there are three key points there that I think uh, we might want to get uh, our panelists to speak to. I'll go to Dave first on the references and the studies that we looked at uh, in the report. And then after that, we could go to well integrity. There were some pretty high numbers there quoted. And uh, also the deep well injection issue. Dave? Yes. Uh, going back, in terms of the studies that uh, you mentioned that we didn't include some, we, since this document was released, we continue to review studies as they become available. So the list of references do show a lot of the key re uh, reports we've looked at, but it's not an exclusive list. And if you do have studies from ProPublica that you think we should look at, please forward them to me, and I'd really like to see them. Um, in terms of the failure rates, I'm familiar with most of the studies you mentioned. Uh, Stephen Batchew was the guy out in Alberta who did, did the studies. Uh, the Duke study, for example, showed methane uh, concentrations increase with proximity to gas wells. It's, it's interesting to note that in both of those studies, the authors did acknowledge that those studies were done prior to the tightening of the uh, cementing and casing standards, uh, both in Pennsylvania and in Alberta. Um, uh, Osborne, who wrote the Duke study, even said he'd be interested to repeat his study with the, with the uh, you know, improved well uh, standards to see if that, that uh, finding could be repeated. Um, so we have to be careful when we're going back, as you said, I think you went back to uh, 2003, uh, things like that. Um, the fact is that the industry perhaps didn't do a very good job in the past in terms of uh, wellbore integrity. I know in Alberta they found that one of the main issues was the cement didn't form a protective layer between the cement, or sorry, between the steel and the geology. So they recommended that increased uh, cementing standards could reduce the leakage rate and reduce the, the, the cement, the, uh, the, the corrosion. So I guess what I'm trying to say is people aren't just sitting back and saying, well, that's, that's fine, we'll accept that. As you said, that's not an acceptable situation, and people are working hard to resolve it. So let's not be blinded by the past, but let's look to the future in terms of how we can address these issues. And that's what we're trying to do with, with some of our recommendations, bearing in mind that new studies are coming out on a regular basis, and we're continuing to monitor them. And our recommendations aren't an end point. They're really a starting point. So, uh, but we do, I do appreciate all those things you mentioned. And uh, I think we are in agreement that it's well bore integrity is, in fact, the key issue. It's not uh, migration of frac fluid through geological formations. It's all about the well bore and all about the containment. And uh, we're, we're fully uh, in agreement with you on that. OK, thank you. Yeah, yeah so I would just like to add that um, in the meantime, while they refine and get the technology right, it's offensive for New Brunswick to be asked to put our families in the front lines and be guinea pigs for this industry. And and, I, and I'm sure people will bring up some of the health studies as well later tonight. But it really is problematic. We are seeing breast cancer rates um, uh, in associated with shale gas areas. And I don't think any of us here in this room want to put um, our daughters or mothers at risk with this industry, which is still young, and it has these inherent well integrity problems, which are not being worked out. There's still, there's still unacceptable le um, levels. All right, thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Christopher Hennessy. I'm a small businessman here in the village of Blackfoot, and I'm also a municipal councillor. I'm going to speak on behalf of myself and uh, express my opinions. To myself, shale gas is the much needed industry that our village needs, as we have no industry left. Our mills are closed. The only jobs we have now are at two gas stations, a hardware store, and a grocery store. And this industry is what we need to keep our young people here from them going out west and leaving their families. A few years ago, I had to go out west myself as there was no work here for me. And getting on the airplane every two weeks isn't without what it cracked up to be. And I feel this industry can be done safe here, and it's what we need. I also feel that this industry can be done 
and our young people can stay here and work at it and see the riches that it can bring. I saw the riches of the West. Young men and women, both my age, houses paid off by 20 years old, working on the second house payment, two or three big four-wheel drives in the dooryard. You don't see that around this country. Our common workers are worrying about the next set of unemployment stamps, which they have a hard job to get around here, and our young people have to leave. No matter what their education, they have to leave to seek work in the West. I'm going to make this short and sweet. I'm not going to try and save the salmon or the whales, but I'd like to see shale gas come here, and our family has 200 acres of woodlot, and I'd love to see rigs sitting on it fracking. And I'd also, down the road, I plan on having young kids, and I'd be proud to say that they worked in the oil and gas industry. Thank you, Councillor. Yes? It's uh, Sheila Young O'Kane. And uh, my maternal roots are on the river, although the maternal side of the family migrated to the neighboring county of Gloucester. Good evening, Dr. LaPierre, panel. Um, we met you in Bathurst, and the reason I came here tonight is because after leaving the Bathurst uh, session, I had more questions than ever and comments I wished I had made. And I know I'm going to leave here tonight the same way which means I'll probably go home and spend a couple of days of vacation trying to put together my thoughts to get in to you by email before the end of your, your time. Um, I appreciate that our Premier has inher inherited a, a terrible debt. Um, I appreciate the fact that we need to pay for services. I appreciate the fact that young people need jobs. I'm not convinced that a shale gas industry is the answer. I wish now I had the binder that I left in Anuvik in 2005, which was about three inches thick and was the, a court case and decision regarding an Alberta farmer who did sue and did win his case. But these things are all kept very hush. Uh, things aren't as benign as they may seem. I take objection to the fact that often these presentations look pretty. I uh, feel a rage when I read that first paragraph that talks about, well, New Brunswick has had an oil and gas industry since 1859. That was a totally different kind of industry, not the same at all, for one well of a, of a convention. Oh, okay, let me start back up. A, um, one of the oil, the fracking wells, can use, one well can use up to 5 million gallons of water compared to 50,000 in a con conventional oil and gas well. That's a big difference. We're talking about a totally different industry. Now, I know they have been fracking in various parts around the country, and I think that there have been a lot of problems that have arose. We talk about now we have new technology, so we're going to do it better and safer. Well, um, we have lots of, you know, I've been around the block a few times. I'm midway through my 60s. Um, I grew up in a time when we didn't have huge houses or four by fours in the yard. In fact, running water only came in sometime in my home after I was in grade six. Electricity only came in after I was born. Um, so I have an idea what living kind of low grade and close to the land is. And I have a feeling that um, if we keep going with this unsustainable boom bust kind of uh, mentality, that we're going to, well, maybe not, I won't, I'll be dead by then, thank God. But those that are younger than I are going to be uh, thrust back, not by choice, but by the design of nature to a much less prosperous time. Um, let me say something else. Uh, as for house values, well, I'm not familiar with, I was, one of the questions I was going to ask, but it was sort of answered, is like how many companies are here, and you said nine. And I'm only familiar with uh, four. Um, Corridor, Apache, which I guess has given back some of what it had to Corridor, Swin, and uh, Petroworth. We haven't heard much about Petroworth recently. Um, and boy, do I have a lot to say about that one, but I'll, I won't bore you tonight with that. Um, 
I am familiar with one area then closer to the, the Elgin, not Elgin, Ontario, but Elgin, New Brunswick area, where I know uh, of one couple with a beautiful log home, and they have just dropped their price. And now it was before the, the fracking started. The realtors were out there and it had a certain price. It has now been dropped $63,000 and they still can't get a bite on it. I also know a couple with, uh, whose levels, in, they've, they've had health issues in the past, so they've been tracking their blood and urine for a long time. And I think Mr. Beliveau, they're looking for an answer back from you too, they're still waiting. Um, I think Maxim is wanting to hear the, some response from you on, on that particular issue. Yeah, we spoke about it Friday night a little Did bit you? at okay. our meeting, yeah. Good. Um, but their levels uh, of different uh, contaminants has certainly increased. Now, something else, near their house, now they're, they're just past the 1.5. They're uh, about 1.65, I think it is, from the well site. Uh, from one of the, from, from um, Corridors B41 and Apache's G41, which I guess are within six feet of each other. Um, I had a call because she was going to have to, they were going to have to vacate their house. Uh, Corridor, who has taken over both well sites again, had said they were going to flare and because of their health issues, they were to leave and stay away for a week. Well, that got cancelled because when Apache drilled and fracked, and they did a bit of flaring, um, but they needed to do it again, apparently, but something is stuck down there. Are you familiar with that? So they can't do it, so everything's on hold again? That's correct. Uh, the other thing is that you've talked about uh, 30, 30 wells in that McCulley area, but I thought it was up more, like I said, the night, uh, at least 35 plus four nearby. So things keep changing all the time. And, and my last point will be, I mean, we've had other mines uh, in our area and even uh, quarries, and the monitoring there isn't done. The Nigadu mine site is still a, a, a cesspool and has become a garbage dump. Environment doesn't have the capacity to go out and monitor and, and make things right, or see that somebody makes things right. So um, all of these wonderful recommendations with all the should, 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 shoulds. Um, you know, I've seen the cod fishery go down. I've seen uh, the linamide that wasn't going to harm babies. I've seen all kinds of things that weren't going to be a problem, be a problem. You know, when, uh, when the French first came, they couldn't move their ships very fast because of the, the number of fish that were holding them back. And we see what our progress has done to that. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. And I, I would certainly, Mrs. O'Kane and, and uh, other participants, point out that uh, Dr. LaPierre has been receiving a, a lot of comments. And if you have any reports or further comments that you might have forgot at a meeting, uh, by all means, email on the screen and it'll get to us and to Dr. LaPierre. No problem whatsoever. Sir? Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Bradley Pond and I'm from Doketown. I was born and raised here, and I plan to stay here until the day I die. But if something doesn't happen to our economy very soon, I, like many others, may have no choice but to go west. I've been following the shale gas controversy from almost its beginning stages, and I'm not here tonight to throw out numbers. Everybody can look up whatever they want on the Internet. Um, according to Stats Canada, the population of Doketown in 2011 was 793 people. Five years before that, the population was 888. This is a drop of 95 people in only five years. That may not seem like very much, but in a small place like Doketown, that's a lot. As population continues to decline, the age of our communities goes up. The average age of the Doketown population is 52 years old. Compare this to a gas and oil area such as Fort McMurray, which ironically is where all of our young people are going, which has an average age of only 31 years. I'm no mathematician, but I know this is a large difference. This province needs to boost the economy and keep its young people in New Brunswick. And one of the best opportunities to prevent itself yet is shale gas. Mr. LaPierre, I read the article in today's Telegraph quoting you as saying, it's quite obvious that the people who have showed up at these forums have been against the project. There's no question about that. The ones we heard are definitely against it, and there's no denying that those who have showed up do not want the gas, end quote. Well, I think that kind of ends here tonight in Blackville. 
In front of you tonight are the mayors of Doak Town and Blackville, as well as our MLA, Jake Stewart. These are elected officials who their communities have voted into government to bring a prosperous future to our area. These three gentlemen, well, I can speak for two for sure, are supporters of the shale gas project and represent the views of a lot of their constituents that voted them in. Shale gas may not be welcome in Stanley or Pennyac or Durnbridge or Bucktouche, but you can bet your bottom dollar that the people of Blackville, Doak Town, and surrounding areas no longer want to live in a have-not province. Mill after mill, business after business continues to shut down. The people of the Miramichi want to live in the beautiful area, work here, prosper here, and raise a family here. Don't think that this entire province is against shale gas, because for every anti-fracking protester who is being loud, there are 10 supporters of silent shale gas who remain silent. It's a few of us that have enough courage to stand up for it that have to speak for our side. Before you make your decision, which it kind of seems by today's article that you may have already done that, I hope that's not true, listen to the supporters of this side and remember the big green sign you saw when you came into Blackville. Say yes to shale gas. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. October 2010 from uh, British Columbia. My husband has a natural gas industry pension. He worked for the industry for many years and we lived in northern British Columbia in parts of the province where it was still sour gas. As far as that scientist who said there's no leaks, I'd like to tell him about the time that I had to be um, evacuated from my home with my cats and my dogs because there was a huge leak. I'd like to point out another time when some horses were found dead after another big leak on somebody's property that had one of these uh, little gas wells on it. So as far as no leaks, there's going to be leaks. Everything breaks down. Um, I'd also like to address the gentleman before me. Uh, he believes he's going to get some great job as a result of this. I'd like to tell you what's going to happen. Uh, initially, there'll be jobs for your local backhoe operators, people like that, to actually help dig and uh, put the pipeline in. There'll be compressor stations every 50 to 100 miles. Those compressor stations are going to be run by people with tickets. So if anybody here wants a job, they better go back to school right now and get themselves educated because if they're working at Walmart now, they are not going to be working in the natural gas industry tomorrow without an education. It's just not going to happen. The people getting the jobs are going to be coming from Alberta and British Columbia with their experience and their tickets. And Good, so those of you who have the experience will get a job, but the rest of you forget. There isn't going to be that many jobs. There just simply isn't going to be anyway. Um, for the most part, if the uh, gas pipeline, something blows up, for instance, that's going to be um, people that are brought in from somewhere else. They could be from Houston, Texas, who knows. Um, as far as running the compressor station, um, the stations my husband worked at could also be run from Vancouver by computer. They don't need more than a couple of people per station. So the only jobs there's going to be is maybe some more jobs at McDonald's and stuff because when these people come in from Houston, they're going to be looking for a, a hotel to uh, stay at and somewhere to eat. So that's the job part. And then I just like to address people's property values. Um, it's going to be a long, long time, like they said to begin with, before we actually have, if they go ahead with this, a natural gas industry in New Brunswick. In the meantime, you guys can all consider your property worthless. I'm in the process of looking for rural property. I'm looking from Blackville to Minto. And I'm putting the whole thing on hold. I'm willing to pay cash for this property, but I am not buying anybody's property till I know what's going on. It's just not going to happen, and I'm not alone. And the fellow over here that was talking about um, Fort McMurray, well, he needs to check out what's been going on lately. The federal government has pretty much killed the housing industry in Canada anyway with their new mortgage rules. Fort McMurray is not the big place to be uh, trying to buy a house at. They're overpriced, and they're going to go down. I've seen Fort St. John with every house boarded up just about in the bus part of this boom and bust thing that's going to come to New Brunswick if, uh, if this does happen. Um, as far as the water on fire, um, uh, it was a lovely ad that you guys put in about the clean glass of water, but I'm sorry, I'm not buying that one either. I've seen what a disgusting, dirty industry this can actually be when it's hidden from the public up north or in BC. 
When it's down in Vancouver and you got it coming out of your gas furnace, it's all good. But it's not that good up north. And I would just like to say one more thing. I just think that the government in power in New Brunswick right now is just woefully uneducated on the subject. They're looking for some big dollars here. They're not, it's, it's appalling at their lack of education on the subject and they really need to get with this and quit listening to these gas people. They're not looking after your best interests here in this room. They only want the money. They don't care about you at all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll just ask everybody to, to try to focus their comments because we, we don't want to leave anybody out. And there's one, two, three, four, five. Somebody just ducked down, so there's five. Somebody was just standing there. So if we could just focus our comments, that'd be great. Um, my name is Garth Hood, and I'm from Fredericton. And I apologize for being here because I would rather be at a meeting in Fredericton. And I don't think the people of Blackville should have to listen to what I have to say being from Fredericton, but here I am because I'm not giving an op given an opportunity to speak. Um, but on that note, I have been to another meeting, and I would like to thank Dr. Lapierre for uh, listening to everyone every time he's been there. I do feel he has listened, and I do appreciate uh, the perspective you bring to having this, this meeting and letting us speak and say what we have to speak, say. Um, listening to some of the people from Blackville, uh, I would like to address what has been said and to say, I'm, although I've lived in Fredericton, I've also lived in St. David Ridge, near St. Stephen. I've lived in Cross Creek, near Stanley. So I've spent half my time in New Brunswick in rural places and half my time in the city. I know what it's like in both places. Um, neither place was that well off economically, so I can sympathize with that. Um, and I would be happy to sit down with any one of you and have a coffee and have a discussion about what economic development is. I do not think this in any way is going to be economic development. This is a boom-bust cycle, and if you look at the history of the world, if you look at boom-bust cycles, they tend to have a peak and then it goes back down way worse than it was when it started. So if you're only concerned about the next 20 or 30 years, then go for it. Take, take what few jobs you can get. But if you really care about your children and your children's children, you should be concerned about this. Because I don't think you're getting what you're being sold. I, I really think there are missed truths that are being sold out there. And the analogy that I would make would be looking back at the way the te tobacco industry has functioned over the past 60, 80, 100 years. Back in 1938, if I remember right, the first study came out about tobacco and all the dangers of tobacco, very similar to the research that is coming out now, which is peer-reviewed, done by scientists who are disinterested. They're not, they're, they're people that work in institutions that do research. They don't necessarily have a vested interest in whether fracking will or what won't survive. And similar things happen in the tobacco industry. But the American Medical Association ignored that research for over 30 years. And look what happened. We, are, we now have definitive proof that there is a connection between smoking tobacco and lung cancer. And I don't think there's very many people nowadays that would refute that. This is very similar to what's going on right here. Um, and there's also a big body of evidence that suggests, well, there's actually, it's more than suggestion. Um, in the tobacco industry, there were lies and there were mistruths presented by industry. The same kind of information is coming about, out about the industry in fracking as well. I have a research document here, again, third-party, peer-reviewed research that, that makes that very statement in the abstract of their, their document that the industry is lying. Um, I didn't make it up. I read it in a paper that comes out of university, okay? So I'm trying to find the truth here, and I'm willing to talk about any person about the truth, but this is what I read and I see their glossy brochures, so I'm confused. 
And I really, as much as any New Brunswicker, wherever they are, I really want the truth. And I don't want people to be sold a bill of goods and to be sold lies only to be disappointed 10 years from now and they're saying, what went on? Does ev can every single person here from Blackville go to their MP's office, look them in the eye, and believe everything they said and everything they've ever said and everything every politician has said? If you can do that, take the jobs. If you can't, Please respect us people from New Brunswick who have spent, I've probably spent 40 or 50 hours researching this, looking at all sides, because I want the truth. And I don't think my government is providing it to me. So, like I said, I'm willing to sit down with any one of you and to talk about what I've seen and how I see economic development. And from my research, the best way to develop communities is it with community-based initiatives. And if government supported community-based initiatives, give the forests back to the people in Blackville, if they could do that, then we would have jobs again. But as long as you have somebody who has a residence outside of New Brunswick developing this province, and that's what it's turned into, whether you like it or not, you won't have very much money coming into your community. You need people living in your community, providing economic development for your community, or else that money's gonna leak out of your community. That's the way I see it, and that's the research that I've seen suggests that. So that my research shows that countries like Germany that are doing this, they have decided to put a moratorium on nuclear energy, they have a moratorium on fracking, um, they are trying to move away from nuclear, and they are also one of the most powerful economies in the world. And they have an ecological conscience. They have sustainable forests. They do not clear cut. They make things like wood fiber insulation. We have all these extra wood chips in this province. Why can't we make wood fiber insulation for our houses in New Brunswick, for the houses in Ontario? Why are we burning it? Why aren't we turning these things into valuable resources? And those are the questions I ask. I just want to know the alternatives, okay? And I would love to think this would provide jobs, but I really don't think it will. And I would love someone to prove me wrong. Okay, that's... Mr. Hood, I'd ask you to, to okay. try to wrap up. Yeah, and... And we appreciate that you've come to three of our meetings. Yes, and... Uh, if... And to address that... I believe if your gas group had done your homework, I wouldn't need to talk so much. Uh, okay? That's fine. Um, so I, I'm, gonna I'm just looking behind you at all the people behind you, many of them from yeah, this community. I understand. Um, I will be brief and quick. I made most of my points. This is a document that I had started at the first meeting that I was at that, that showed different royalty rates. Um, the royalty rates for on the paper given in your document were in the $10 billion range. Um, I requested to get that formula for that almost three weeks ago. I gave my information. I have yet to seen it. So I made up my sheet that's just as pretty as the one in your book, but I have different numbers. And my numbers range from $3 million to about $1.7 billion. So that's 6.2 times difference to up to 3,000 times difference from the royalties. And I'll leave it this time because I haven't heard anything else. But I'm just saying that just because the government can produce a nice document doesn't mean it's true. There were no citations, no references, and no formula. Okay? Um, the other quick question I have is, on your, on your committee, is there a toxologist? on the gas group. A toxicologist? Yeah, toxicologist. I think there should be. It's a really critical issue. Um, um, the other, the... Just, uh, oh, Annie wanted to make a point. I'll just really briefly. Um, as you've noted and others have noted, we don't deal with uh, human health in this document because the Department of Health is doing an independent uh, report okay. and uh, they are consulting and are, have been talking to toxicologists. Okay. Uh, the other issue that I have, has is anybody um, in the group familiar with um, underground biological life? Because there is a lot of research recently that has come up that the, the biological life beneath the surface of the, 
the earth is actually as great or greater than that above the earth. And I think if we're going to be pu pumping these vast amount of chemicals into the ground at a great rate, we really do need to consider about the biological web of life under the ground so we don't up, end up doing what we've done to the fisheries, which is basically obliterate them. And that affects rural New Brunswickers as well. I can leave it there. I thank you for your time, and I'll leave some stuff with you. Thank you. I believe I'm up next. My name is Maggie Connell, and I live in Durham Bridge. I want to clarify with the young man who who spoke so well of, and so passionately about wanting to stay in New Brunswick and build his home and, and his family here, uh, and that shale gas was actually going to allow him to do that. Uh, then we heard from uh, a woman back here who talked about her own experiences in, in, from BC and how jobs happened or did not happen, and actually who got them. And she spoke of getting, going back to school and getting tickets so that you could work in the shale gas industry. I just want you to know that my, I have two sons. They are both tradespeople. They've got double tickets, each of them. And neither of them is qualified to work in this industry. It's very specific. And you have to have that kind of training. So that's just... I just want to clarify that one point. <clears throat> I have a question, uh, just for clarification. Is Blackville within the least area? Is it actually sitting within the least area? Craig, could you answer that? Um, excuse me, sir. Could you step aside because I can't see the panel? Thank you. Yes, is Blackville within the least area? Um, a definitive answer here. I, I believe it's no. Blackville is just, just to the north, right on the border of the least okay, area. Okay, so it is not within the least area. Is that correct? So I'm wondering, I'm sitting here wondering, because we're looking at the maps and we can't quite figure out. It doesn't look like it's in the area that's been leased. And I'm trying to understand how we come to be in Blackville, having this meeting, deciding about... Uh, an industry that is not going to actually affect Blackville, but is going to affect Durham Bridge and Pennyac and every other place within the least area. So that's just a comment. I'm glad you made that clarification. The rest of it, I would like to address to Ann Daigle. Uh, it's Ann Daigle, is it? It's Annie, yes. Annie? Okay. And you're a hydrogeologist, is that correct? That's Could correct. you speak into the mic because I have some uh, questions. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, where does groundwater come from? I need a real good explanation of that. Where does groundwater come from? Well, groundwater typically comes from the surface. It recharges in. It comes from recharge areas into discharge areas. Okay, so it, it flows kind of like from rainwater and that sort of thing through the, it, like it's surface water that eventually ends up groundwater. Is that correct? And most groundwater is very far traveled. Um, if your well is um, very shallow and mm -hmm. is susceptible to turbidity, it goes murky after rain or has bacteria, then it's a very um, short and well, it's just shallow. I know, I know. But deeper groundwater, like fast flowing groundwater, moves about 100 meters per year. So okay. it's very slow moving. Yeah. Okay. So, but groundwater comes from surface water essentially, right? And then I want to know. Shallow, yeah. yeah deeper okay. stuff comes for, for further travel right. and could be a couple thousand years old. Yeah. So, am I right that in periods of heavy rain or yeah, heavy precipitation, let's say, or snow run, uh, melting in the spring, that sort of thing. There's a huge influx of water that a lot of it probably flows along the surface and out to the ocean. Yeah, only about 15%, I think, right. um, infiltrates into groundwater, okay, and the rest of it runs right. off or evapotransports. Okay, well, that's clear then. So then in periods of dry, where does the water actually come from in our rivers? There are some groundwater-fed streams, um, and uh, in other areas, the water's coming from outside the province into the province. It's a living system. Mm. So. Yeah, but essentially, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is how I understand it, from Environment Canada's website, okay? I see it sort of like a, balance, a balancing thing. When there's too much water here on the surface, right, it sort of 
pushes down into the ground water, right? And then when the, when the surface water is low, it actually draws from the groundwater. Am I right about that? It's sort of like a balancing, kind of a washing back and forth. Is that correct? Uh, not necessarily. It depends on the case. Okay, but it can happen. Is that correct? Th there are groundwater-fed streams. Okay. Yes. So springs, springs right. is groundwater coming to surface. Right. So groundwater can come up to rivers. Rivers can go down into groundwater. So there's a washing back and forth of this water because it's, a, like you say, a living system, right? It's a whole piece. Now... The hydrologic if, cycle, if, yeah. Yes, the hydrologic cycle. If that is true, then is it not also true that any toxins in, the, in any part of that water, whether it's groundwater, whether it's surface water, gets, can get washed back and forth as well? Um, no, not exactly. Um, there's a process of attenuation and, and in terms of being filtered out. That's why um, deeper groundwater is free of bacteria versus um, shallow groundwater wells are not. That's different. Bacteria is a, living, is a living, breathing thing. I'm talking about toxins. If there same are toxins thing. in the surface water, it, it, I have read in many places that it's also true that those toxins can get washed. They can. I'm not saying they do. I'm saying they can get washed back and forth as well. I want to ask you this. Do we know where our groundwater is in New Brunswick? Yes. We know exactly where it is. Has that been mapped? We have groundwater maps of the province, yes. No, they, you have not, you do not have any mapping or very little mapping of the, maybe I should clarify, maybe I'm talking about aquifers, right? There, we don't have aquifer mapping in New Brunswick. We have, we have some Early. aquifer. Some, we some. We do not have a complete system of aquifer mapping in New Brunswick. Let's make it clear to the people so that, as the previous speaker said, that we can all at least know the truth. I want my son's home. I also want this province to not go down the shitter for it. Okay? So, I just want the truth. We are talking about messing with our water beneath the ground, and we don't even know where the hell it is. Uh, yes, we do. Yes, sir, go ahead. Again, I would, I would please encourage you to, to make your points as... I'm going to be very short. Thank, well, you're not very short. You're the tallest <laughs> guy so far. My name is uh, Gene Kelly, and I live in Derby. Um, I guess we've heard from everybody here tonight except David Suzuki, and uh, I would ju I just have a few comments. Uh, <clears throat> with our uh, aging population in, in New Brunswick and all of our young people uh, hopping on airplanes and heading west, uh, we cannot s sustain a province here on those brown envelopes that are delivered to your mailbox at the end of every month. So we need something. Our forest industry is gone. Our fishing industry is gone. What have we got left? Unless we bring in something like the gas industry, we're going to be a ghost province. Not a ghost town, a ghost province. Thank you. That was very short. Thank you, sir. Now, I never prepared much to get up here, but I was watching online, so I figured I'd show up. Can you tell us your name, sir? My name is Jonathan Walls. I'm from the village of Blackville. And uh, a lot of issues concern people in every village in New Brunswick. And um, based on the research done by our government and the uh, conflicting opinions of other people, I think this is more or less an attack on the government. Um, and if it isn't, then um, what is it? Uh, maybe it's like they say, maybe they're concerned. But if they're concerned, I'd like to make a request from the naysayers. Um, if you don't trust the government to make a solution other than shale gas, then I'd like to see organize, something organized so you guys can figure out how to fix it yourselves. If you, if you don't want to trust the government, that's the only other option. That's it. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> yes, ma'am? Good evening, uh, everybody. Uh, my name is Julia Linke. I live in Teemouth, New Brunswick. I was not able to go to the Durham Bridge meeting, so I'm here today. 
The documents that you have given here are, as other people have pointed out, simply should be recommendations. Last year we have had actual regulations in place that did not prevent violations from happening. Instead, Windsor Energy renewed their, got just their license renewed two months ago. No regulations in the world can change the way this industry is done. The facts are available. You, they are written up and we, can all, we all have heard them tonight and at many other places. To say that there will be no problem or long-term consequences is simply denying the evidence. Sometimes we want something so bad that we cannot differentiate between right and wrong. Wrong becomes right and right becomes wrong. Listening to what I've been hearing here tonight really has reinforced in me this view that we still hold in here. We are a resource-based economy. But at the same time, I hear people say, well, the fish are gone, the timber industry is gone, well, now we need natural gas. I myself studied forestry at UNB in this province. So I've, I've learned about forest management. I grew up in the Black Forest where silviculture is used to grow forests sustainably over hundreds of years. My point here tonight, I just like to say is, natural gas will be the very next industry that in 10 years down the road we will be saying, well, now natural gas is going to be gone. Problem is, problem is, we will be in a state that we're not in now. We will have a short benefit. Some individuals may have a short-term benefit because we all already have heard the facts. Why not? But we will suffer long-term consequences. And the picture of Alberta that has been picked, uh, painted here, I have also lived there. And maybe, it's correct, you go to Calgary, to Edmonton, to Rocky Mountains, it's beautiful. I love it. Uh, Please talk to the people in Fort Chibiwayan or watch the movie Downstream, the Athabasca River. There is no more clean water. There is no more wildlife. People are dying. <laughs> this industry is new, but not that new. We've had it for 10, 12 years in North America. We have collected our experiences there on fact. We do not need to be the guinea pigs anymore. <laughs> Many other places have caught on. Germany, Bulgaria, France, states in US, Quebec, our neighboring province. They have all said no to this industry. So why would we now start it? knowing what we already know. Very recently, we have had a highly respected group of New Brunswickers speak out. People that you and I and every one of us needs, the medical doctors, they have spoken and said that they support a moratorium because they don't have the tools to, to treat people with the fracking uh, risks and the health impacts. So they've said no. How can we ignore such an advice of those people that we need every day for our helping survival? I, I can only speak for myself today and represent seven people of my family. My husband, my children, my mother, my father, my sister all here in New Brunswick. And those voices, we're saying no. No to this industry. And that is all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, sir? My name is Ed Armstrong. I'm from Sussex, New Brunswick, the heart of the natural gas industry in New Brunswick. Yeah, please step closer to the mic a bit, okay. please. My name is Ed Armstrong. I'm from Sussex, New Brunswick, the heart of the natural gas industry in New Brunswick. Now, I'm going to make one statement here that is going to open quite a few eyes. I'll read it. I don't know anybody who is for this industry that wants any environmental devastation. We all want and need the same things. We want clean water. We want fresh air. We want to be able to grow vegetables. 
that are free of contaminants. We all want to live where we're comfortable with a minimum of disruption from industrialization. That is our choice. All of us, those of us who are for this industry as well as those opposed, we want the same things as you. However, we differ on how this can, be, this can happen. On June 4th, a report came out of the United States stating that greenhouse gas emissions were 50% lower from natural gas than the EPA had predicted, suggesting it was time for the EPA to revise their standards. Fact is, greenhouse gas emissions have declined in the U.S. between 2007 and 2012. The only thing they did different, they converted their coal plants to natural gas plants. There was also a slump in the economy, which lowered the demand for electricity. It's my understanding that everybody's talking about well casing design. In Sussex, in Locully Field and Penobscot, there are 30 operating gas wells. It's my understanding there's about 42 that have been drilled. To this date, no one can show me where there has been a casing failure at the Macaulay gas field. Not one individual opposed to it can show me which well failed, because they didn't. Wastewater management. Everybody's concerned what's going to happen to the water it used in fracking. Is it going to be trucked down the road to divert? Are we going to risk an environmental spill on the highway? Just an example, in northern BC, Apache Canada spent $100 million building a water processing plant in the middle of their lease, away from major populations. Therefore, they did not have to truck the fracking fluid anywhere. It was taken freight from the site to their own plant, processed, and recycled, reused. This is where this industry is going. Yes, mistakes were made. <clears throat> There's also a group on Facebook called Dimmick Proud. They will tell you Dimmick is not a wasteland, just as Penobscot is not a wasteland. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Armstrong. I just wanted to check with this gentleman here. We made you sit down earlier, and, and did you... No, did you want to speak? Uh, we, can, we can ask, we'll ask you to, uh, is that okay? Okay, sure. My name's, oops, there you go. My name's Wayne Holt. I live beside the prison, not in it, down the road here. <laughs> and anyway, uh, I've got a few technical comments and one legal comment. I went to school in Medicine Hat, Alberta, and it's known as the gas city. <clears throat> this is in the early 60s. They have a lot of gas wells there. It was a smart enough city to buy up their wells to supply the uh, city still, and probably to infinity, with energy. They had gas wells that blew out. This is 1960s technology. Our, one of our sports, when we were teenagers going to school, was to go out and watch them fight the gas wells. Red Adair, the famous Texan, was there, and he used to spend months fighting these gas wells. Those gas wells, a lot of them are still there. You never see them blowing up anymore. That's how the technology has changed from the 1960s to the present. Eh? So it's real safe. I've never, when I lived there, I've never seen where a house blew up. I've heard of one in Calgary because of malfunction in the gas system. But in general, it seemed very safe. Our utility bill in 1962 and three was $2 per month. Everything but your phone and your light was operated by gas. Refrigerators, stoves, the whole works, eh? And it was a clean energy. You know, uh, never had any smell from it or anything like that. In fact, I think the city had to put sulfur or something in there, a little bit of sulfur, so you could smell it, you know, if it leaked or something. But anyway, that's, that's my experience with gas out there. You know, now, fracking, I don't know if they did it back then or not, but they drilled these gas wells anyway and capped them and pumped them off. Eh? And a few little technical things that come to my mind. As the moderator, you said the chairman was taking information back to the government and Fred to share with me. One is... Uh, in the, in the mid-80s, we had an earthquake up there. It was very substantial, about 30 miles west of here on the Plash Rock Highway. We fell it in Halifax, eh? Now, in the event, if they ever had another earthquake in that same area where a lot of this gas is going to be occur, and I'll, I'll address this to the geologists on the team there, is there any possibility that would rupture these uh, pipes or whatever you put under the ground there and have, you know, uh, leakage, bad leakage in that? Now, that's just a possibility, you know, so that's one technical thing. Eh? 
And the other is a legal thing. Uh, Enbridge, I think it is, they call it. And it's, I could be correct on this information because I get it from the media. Uh, they got permission to put a pipeline through the province, most likely subsidized by the province. And they did all the uh, groundwork to uh, expropriate properties to build the pipeline. They got, and I understand they give them a 20 year uh, a monopoly on distributing gas in emerging. And what I've read anyway, and these could be wrong things. But what I read was they put the price up 400% after you got people hooked up to the gas prices, eh? You know, right or wrong, you're going to, you know, correct me. And now they're suing the problems for uh, over half a billion dollars of taxpayers' money. It's at stake. So are we going to have uh, lawyers who put these uh, uh, contracts in place between the gas companies, exploration companies, whatnot, and the province? Are they going to have protections from us taxpayers being sued down the road by these companies? Okay. So that's basically the only comments I have on that. Th that's terrific. Thank you for those questions. Uh, Craig, did you want to speak to the uh, earthquake issue? Or? Sure. Um, yeah, uh, excellent question regarding the, uh, the earthquake issue. Um, it, it's, uh, it is uh, certainly of a concern if you were to have a large enough magnitude earthquake. Uh, the, the new standards for well construction with the new cements that they're using and, and the new steel casing designs uh, can, can withstand quite a magnitude of earthquake. I don't know exactly what magnitude it is, but there are studies out there that do address that. Um, certainly in New Brunswick, uh, you pointed out the one that was in the 80s, and uh, from time to time we do have uh, seismic activity. Actually, approximately, you know, monthly we have uh, very small ones, but most of them are not felt by, uh, by uh, us uh, here, uh, but there are the occasional large ones, so it's, uh, it's, your, your point is well taken. And on the Enbridge issue, uh, Dave, did we have anything on, from a legal perspective? What we're gonna, the, the beauty of these meetings is when there's points made to us that, and that might be one, where we'll have to take it back and Dr. LaPierre and, and we'll research that. And we certainly appreciate your comments very much. Yes. Carolyn Lu Oops. There you go. <laughs> My name is Carolyn Lubadarcy. I'm from Fredericton, and I'm sorry <laughs> that I have to drive all the way here to attend a meeting. I wasn't able to attend the ones closer to my city, and we're not getting meetings, so I'm here. Um, I'm a health professional, and um, this industry is really quite young when it comes to studying health effects uh, as related to the pollution, the, the air pollution that is involved with this industry. So I don't know how anybody can say that leakages don't happen because uh, there, there have been some studies that have come out recently. There's a three-year study, uh, probably the first major health study by the Colorado School of Public Health that came out and it found that chemicals in the water and air in Garfield County, Colorado um, were, were definitely there and they found health effects were moderate to high. There's another study that finds that in Texas, like in most of the United States, breast cancer rates are going down, except in, in one place, the Barnett Shale, which is where fracking is happening. The five counties where there was the most drilling saw a rise in breast cancer throughout the counties, when, where everywhere else there was a reduction. So I know that you can, uh, mention, you can say that this is anecdotal evidence, but I think that we need to see more health studies before we can feel safe about accepting this industry. And uh, I just wanted to make a few quick comments about some comments that people have made before me. Uh, one about Penobscot. Um, I know and I've spoken to several people who live there who are going through the arbitration process that has not been completed yet. And I definitely have not heard a nice picture about what's happened there. Uh, maybe all the things that they've gone through are not related to fracking, but they're related to mining industry. And if those people are not going to be helped uh, for the problems that they've had to put up with, I don't think that we can all feel very safe about being helped out by the industry that's coming and promising to do this now. <laughs> Another comment I want to make is just regarding economics. I know I understand that you know we are a have-not province, and unfortunately it seems that broken communities will accept resource uh, development more readily because we feel desperate. I don't understand why our government is spending all this energy on something that has a lot of problems, you know, a lot of mitigation, a lot of crazy things that we need to look at when there's still a lot of risk, even when we do the mitigation. Why don't we spend the energy and the money that we're going to be spending when this industry comes here on developing the renewable energy economy that we need to get? 
we all know that this is inevitable. So we can either take this industry and suffer the consequences and be stuck with a more messed up province in the future, and we will have to be jumping on this renewable energy bandwagon that other countries are jumping on now, and I really don't understand that we are not doing this right now. That is the solution. And it will lead to more economic benefit, sustainable jobs. It's been proven in other places that have done, started to do this, and I don't know why we are not doing this. Thank you. Thank you very much. No. Is it my turn? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, the only reason I came here was because I heard that you were not going to be in Fredericton. I, I came here with a message to the government of New Brunswick, uh, the Aboriginal perspective. My name is Alma Brooks. I am Olustukwik Wabanaki. My territory is the whole of the St. John River Basin watershed. My people have never surrendered title to an inch of our land or water. Aboriginal means indigenous, or Indian water rights are substantially unimpaired in Eastern Canada. This is a quote. There has been no vesting of government ownership or administration of water resources in southern Quebec, New Brunswick, or PEI, and restrictions on the grant of riparian land came too late to prevent Indian ownership. The United Nations Declaration on the Right of Indigenous Peoples demands respect for Indigenous peoples' rights and the dignity of Mother Earth, and it condemns the destruction and the privatization of life in this natural world. The role of indigenous people in New Brunswick is invisible because the provincial government has not made real commitments to respect and enforce indigenous people's collective rights. The only thing we see, and we saw this during the bilateral uh, agreement at the parliament, uh, basically it just, it turns out to be bells and whistles, the show and tell exercise and grandstanding for photo ops with our elders. You do not have the free, prior, and informed consent of the Wabanaki people to destroy our land and water. Free, prior, and informed consent is a process that is necessary to fulfill your duty to consult with Aboriginal Indigenous people. Free means that it includes the absence of coercion and outside pressure, including monetary inducement, unless they are mutually agreed on as a part of a settlement process. And the divide and conquer tactics, indigenous people must ha be able to say no and not be threatened with or suffer retaliation if they do so. Prior means that there must be sufficient lead time to allow information gathering and sharing processes to take place, including translations into our languages, and the verbal dissemination as needed according to the decision-making processes of the indigenous peoples in question. This process must take place without time pressure or time constraint. A plan or a project must not begin before this process is fully completed and an agreement with the indigenous people concerned is reached. Informed means that all relevant information reflecting all views and positions must be available to, for consideration by the indigenous people concerned. This includes the input of traditional elders, spiritual leaders, and traditional knowledge holders. The decision-making process must allow adequate time and resources for indigenous people to find and consider impartial, balanced information as to the potential risks and benefits of the, propose, uh, the proposal under consideration. And consent means that it involves the clear and compelling demonstration by the indigenous people concerned of their agreement to the proposal under consideration. The mechanism used to reach agreement must itself 
be agreed to by indigenous people concerned and must be consistent with their decision-making structures and criteria. For example, traditional consensus procedures. Agreement must be reached with the full and effective participation of the leaders, representatives of decision-making institutions authorized by the indigenous people themselves. And that is the process. Free, prior, and informed consent is the process that is required for your duty to consult with indigenous people. What, what I have here from both sides here tonight is a matter of who is telling the truth and who is lying. That, like, you know, don't listen to either side. Go and find out for yourself what the truth is. And I fully understand these young people who want to stay here and they want to be able to provide for their families. Sure they do. Everybody does. But at any cost? And I think what we have to think about is that when we look our children and our grandchildren in the eye, when we make our decision, yes or no, to this industry, because if you have to say, I'm sorry, it'll be too late. So that's all I have to say is be very sure. Be very sure. I went personally to Penobscot because a film, a film crew out of Ontario was doing documentary on seven rivers in Canada. And the St. John River and the Kennebecasis River were among them. And we went up into that area and visited. They became very interested in the community of Penobscot and heard about the struggles that they were having at the time. And they went right into the homes and of several homes where they had lost their water. And f in their own words, the people there did interviews and talked about what it was like. This is this is farms that were in the family for seven generations and more. And they were forced to sell their herd and because the government wouldn't give them water to, uh, or the company wouldn't give them water to uh, water their cattle. Their cattle needed water. And so, uh, they, and, they, and, and how could they sell their property? The company wasn't going to buy it. And it seems to me that they're in arbitration even today. So I, I have a hard time to see that everything is hunky-dory down there. Uh, the people have suffered there. And I didn't see the government of New Brunswick or the companies rushing headlong to go and help those property owners, those landowners. They were left on their own. So that was just my personal experience that be, you know it was just visiting there and talking with the people so that's all i have to say and I, I ask you to take my message back to the provincial government we certainly will do that ms Brooks. thank you very much thank you <laughs> sir did you want to speak i i you look to me oh, i'm going to ask this young fellow right i'll ask this young fellow and then this young fellow but i bet you you're going to be very brief i can tell just by looking at you you look like somebody who's got it together Looks are deceiving. <laughs> uh, my name is Terry Wishard. I'm from Harvey Station. Uh, I'm a member of the Harvey Environmental Action Team. Um, I, I have a question for Craig Parks. Uh, my question is, is it true that the Marcellus Shale formations are, more, are, are less porous? Uh, you know, the corollary being that are New Brunswick Shale formations more porous than the Marcellus Shale? Is that true? Um, the uh, Marcellus Shale and the New Brunswick Shale that we know about today differ in a lot of uh, a lot of mineralogy ways. Um, New Brunswick's actually kind of unique because we were deposited in a lacustrian system. In terms of the porosity differences, uh, I'm I'm not really sure. I mean, porosity in shale is 
It's actually, it can be quite high. Porosity in shales can be up around 40% uh, in either, but really what you have to talk about is the, is the permeability difference in the shales. And um, that's uh, basically why you have to fracture it to create that artificial per permeability. Um, it would be on the scale of nano darcies, but I, I don't have I don't have those numbers right in front of me right now. Okay. Uh, uh, well, my point, the reason why I brought that to, to our attention was uh, I came across a recent uh, study that was published in the uh, U.S. National Groundwater Association Journal Groundwater. Uh, that's a publication uh, that is peer reviewed by hydrologists and uh, hydrogeologists. Um, that study was performed by a Dr. Tom Miles, who is a researcher and consultant in hydrology and water resources uh, with 28 years experience as a consultant. Uh, this study was a, based on, a, on the Marcellus Shale. It was a model uh, which, uh, uh, to quote, um, uh, just to um, the the lead up for, for that study is that scientists have theorized that impermeable layers of rock uh, would keep uh, fracking fluid, uh, which contains benzene and other dangerous chemicals, safely locked uh, nearly a mile below water supplies. Uh, this view of the Earth's underground geology is a cornerstone of the industry's argument that fracking poses minimal threats to the environment. Um, the study, uh, using computer modeling, as I've mentioned, concluded that natural faults and fractures in the Marcellus, exacerbated by the effects of fracking itself, could allow chemicals to reach the surface in as little as a few years, or within a decade period. Uh, simply put, the rock layers are not impermeable, said the study's author, Tom Miles, an independent hydrologist. Um, the Marcellus shale, he went on to say, is being fracked into very high permeability, he said. fluids could move from uh, most uh, could move from most any injection process. So that was the point that I wanted to make on that. Uh, on the I think um, the uh, the misunderstanding that shale that uh, fracking fluids are going to be locked deep underground and not reach a surface uh, at any point. In time. Could you leave us that documentation? I uh, Dave, will. Dave might already have it. Yeah. Dave, Dave wants to make a point. And I wanted to make one other point. Sure, absolutely. Um, I, a year ago, when I began to take some interest and become involved in this issue uh, as a concerned citizen in the Harvey Station area, I had the uh, fortune of uh, speaking with a gentleman who I met in the Lake George area. Uh, this gentleman identified himself uh, as being a parent of a member of the Natural Gas Working Group. And this gentleman told me that his child said uh, to him that uh, anyone who is opposed to fracking or shale gas extraction does not know what they are talking about. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, we got we to wrap it up. Yeah, uh, sorry, can I make, yeah, just a quick comment on, on the, I'm familiar with the study you're referring to um, in, that suggests that uh, there's potential for shale, sorry, my brain's fried here, uh, potential for fracking fluid to migrate to the surface outside the wellbore. Uh, it just suffices to say there, there are conflicting uh, views of that opinion. I direct you to uh, uh, Davies at the University of Durham, and also even do, uh, uh, the author of the Duke study uh, also that talked about methane migration, Osborne, uh, he felt that migration outside the well bore was highly unlikely as well. So there is some diversity of opinion on that. So. Thank you very much. I keep bumping this young man. Uh, so, um, please go ahead. You got the front mic, please. Go ahead. He said looks are deceiving. He's wrong. They're not deceiving. I am a young man. You're, you're a young man. Uh, Mr. LePierre, Dr. LePierre Pound, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the opportunity to address you this evening. My name is Lauren Amos, and I'm the president, uh, board chairman of Enterprise Miramichi. We run the area from Beta Vin to the rural community of Upper Miramichi. And of course, being an economic development agency, you can take the sign at the top of the hill, the big one that says, say yes to shale gas, and put it in my front yard anytime you like. 
The, the couple of points I want to make before I get to the real one here. The gentleman from uh, somewhere that only identified himself as Joe said he wanted people from Blackville to speak. I live just a couple of kilometers outside Blackville, so I think that qualifies me to speak. Secondly, the lady who stated that uh, nobody in the world would want to have a home near the drill rig that was shown in that picture up there. If you go across the bridge and turn left five kilometers, you'll see a big white house sitting way back near the woods and a huge front lawn. And I'm getting sick and tired of having to cut the grass there twice a week. So bring your drill rig down, set it on that lawn, pay me the uh, rental fee, and I'll go golfing and fishing and enjoy life. And Thirdly, the woman who wondered, what are we doing in Blackville? You're not even affected by this. You should be in the Nashwalk. The last time I checked, the province of New Brunswick had 55 MLAs that represent the entire province of New Brunswick. And if you look on the map, you'll see Blackville in there. Thank you. All right, to get to the short point that I want to make, I have a copy of uh, an editorial page of the Daily Gleaner, Friday, June the 22nd, 2012. I don't usually have much to do with newspapers. I don't trust them too much, but in this particular case, there's a letter written by a gentleman from Moncton by the name of Charles Doucet. So I'm taking Mr. Doucet's word that he knows what he's talking about not the paper. He says, since the PCs took power, six different wells have been drilled, three in Stony Creek and three in Elgin, and at least one has been fracked. At least one means maybe more. My question there is, how many wells have contaminated the water taps in the homes of all those people in Elgin and Stony Creek, so it blew up when they turned the water on? And secondly, how many earthquakes have occurred in the Elgin, Stony Creek area as a result of fracking these wells? Oh wait, there's a little earthquake in Macadam. Maybe that was caused by that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Amos. And, and the answer is no, none to the all the above. Ms. Olin, I'd ask you to be very brief. Don't worry. I just have one comment to make for Dr. LaPierre. I wouldn't want you to go away with the impression that everything about Penobscot is exaggerated in a story. I, too, have been there. And uh, when it comes to, uh, I know there's a lot of debate about whether um, uh, the gas wells or the mining have caused the problems with subsidence and the lack of water and the problems to the homes. And I'm not prepared to debate that tonight. That's not why we're here. But I would like to say that in the process of some part of drilling the test wells there uh, on the flat in the valley in Penobscot, I think it's Corridor Mine, had a very large blowout. And they had uh, radioactive uh, frac fluids, I guess, uh, spew out under high pressure a large amount over a certain time. And um, when the federal government were asked, sorry, when the provincial government were asked to investigate that, they said they would not investigate that but because there was a nuclear component. Uh, it was up to AECL or the federal government to investigate that. When the federal government were asked to investigate that, they were told that from what the company told them they had done in the way of mitigation or cleanup or whatever, that they, that they thought that was good enough and they didn't need to investigate it. So there you go with a major blowout of a fracking well in Penobscot with radioactive content that has not been investigated by anyone in government. Uh, and uh, I've been told, and I don't know this to be a fact, but that basically the material was all just buried in the ground or under sand or something and that that was expected to be the end of it. But I do know for a fact that in the freshet in the spring, when that river does flood, 
that it floods all the way through the gas fields and through the wells and where the compressors are and the ground pads. And there's absolutely no way in the world that that water is not picking up some contamination. So I just want you to know everything's not as rosy in Penobscot as some of the comments tonight would let you think. Thank you. And the last word will be to this gentleman. Did you want to say something? We, we really got to wrap up. You just go ahead, quick, real quick. Uh, this, this gentleman's there first. I'll get him first, and then you'll have the last word, and then Dr. LaPierre. Go ahead, sir. You're going to be brief, I can tell. I'll let the mayor of Doaktown speak for me, since I'm from Doaktown. Okay. Do we want to go ahead? Okay. I am the mayor of Doaktown. That's the one that Bradley talked about, Little Town. In fact, Bradley lives just down the street from me. Nice young man. Hope he can stay in New Brunswick. Uh, I have a, a question or a comment from Dr. LaPierre. I feel really bad that the folks from Taymouth, uh, uh, those places, Fredericton, uh, couldn't have a meeting, and they came here. I appreciate the fact. That's the same for everybody. I would like to ask you if you do one or two things or both, if you, and I know you want your report to be right. I'd like to ask you if you could have another meeting in Durham Bridge or Taymouth for those folks to go and have another one here in the Miramichi. We kind of like a made in Miramichi conversation. And I would like to ask if you could do that so that Miramichiers could sit down here in a room and talk about this situation and get it straightened out ourselves. If you could do that, sir, thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. I mean, we'll, we'll take that under consideration. Sir, I know you're going to be brief. Oh, yes, of course. I taught school for 34 years, and I've been retired 13, so I want to get a chance to talk again. Uh, Stan Dunn from the village of Joketown. Uh, I feel my life is uh, parallel with that of the uh, male uh, Atlantic salmon. I was uh, uh, born in Renews, spawned in Renews, and fooled around a bit on the lower Mamergy. Got some net marks going through Blackville. And I spawned, my, I fertilized my offspring in Doaktown. And this old hook bill is not going back over that route again. I'm staying. Anyway, a few, a few uh, statements, really, comments. I, I read a lot. And I, in fact, uh, the first time uh, I met Mr. Alexander in Doaktown at the Sand Museum, I thought it was very good. Uh, I didn't you know much about it, but the more I learned about it, in fact, uh, Mark Hambrook here uh, on a fishing trip uh, went over much of that in the, uh, in the camp one night with a bunch of us here sailing the river. He was quite fluent that night. His lips were flying and his tongue, so I don't know if we get him here tonight or not. Did you, not <laughs> the language is not good. But anyway, the question is, uh, this is not about which government is in. The Liberal government signed uh, the leases, of course, for this, especially Swin. So I'm not about uh, against the conservative government or so on. It's just simply the process itself. I feel first that if you don't know what's underground, it's like the hydro company, don't dig. You know, we don't know the aquifers. Let's do a study of them. Someone mentioned earlier, I believe, a lady from the table here <laughs> talked about uh, th they know some of them. But I doubt if I took you to Doak Town, you won't know where uh, Doak Brook came from. I mean, you really don't know the aquifers of New Brunswick. You may know certain spots. Like in Doak Town, we have a well-protective area on the south side. We're now looking for one on the north side, but we really don't. Number two, uh, the technology is not here yet. I had a son that had to go to Alberta to pay off his bills here in New Brunswick. He's back in the forestry again, so there's some jobs yet. Uh, it wasn't too long ago that come spring when he started uh, the thinning process, uh, he took my uh, uh, teacher check to get started. But anyway, I I'm all for the jobs and so on. But to me, the technology is not there yet. It's like in health, for example, they went to your gallbladder one time, they cut you in two. Now a little incision, they can suck whatever's in there. So the point I'm saying is we do, we're not ready yet for this, and we're not going to be guinea pigs. Uh, the point is simply, right now, to me, the analogy of this technology is like a surgeon going after your lung with a power saw. <laughs> That's okay. And, and one other thing, too. If, if I were to apply for, uh, from, inter, from uh, Enterprise Machine for some help in, in a business, 
They would want a business plan. Is Mr. Carpenter here tonight? I would think he would want more than my word. He would want more, some more details. And I say to the province of New Brunswick, where's your business plan? Like, it's, I mean, there's money to be spent and money to be earned, but we don't want to spend more than we earn. And it doesn't work. I don't run my house all that way, and we don't know enough. And, and the, the, the request, the demand for some, let's get it right. Let's take time. We're in no hurry. They say some of that stuff underground is 800 million years old. I'm only 65, 66, maybe 66. I'm relatively young compared to that 800 million. Wait a while, a few more years, won't hurt. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And, and look, I, I want to thank you all very much for coming tonight. I think the great thing about New Brunswick is no matter if on what side of the coin you might fall, we, we can have a civil discussion. And with that, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. LaPierre to wrap things up for us. Well, I, I, I too would like to thank you all for coming. And uh, again tonight, we've had some uh, very interesting discussions. Don't hear me. Uh, I, I, would, I too would like to thank you all for coming this evening. I, again, this evening, we've heard some very interesting uh, information from people who care about their province. Uh, you're passionate about the area you live in. Uh, you have an interest in your future. And uh, you uh, made it quite clear that you would like to, be, to have uh, a, a, a limited number of uncertainties. And, and most, some of you have said no uncertainties. So what, we, what I, I heard is that we, we need, uh, there's more work to be done. Uh, we need to uh, look at uh, both sides. And I hope that in my report, uh, I, there was one gentleman, I don't know if he's still here, he quoted from a, a newspaper article, and, and it's right. Uh, I was uh, uh, looking at the meetings past, but the meeting tonight is somewhat very different from the meeting past because we had the opportunity to hear from both sides. So uh, that's what the debate is for. And uh, we're very fortunate in New Brunswick that we have the opportunity to uh, uh, have a government that provides us with these opportunities. If you follow uh, news around the world, you'll see that a lot of countries uh, would uh, give a, uh, uh, you know, the right arm to be able to get up and speak. Uh, they don't have that option. You have that option. And, and I think it's, uh, it's uh, a democracy and uh, uh, hopefully you will continue to speak for what you believe in. So with that, I can only say that I will report on what I've heard. Uh, you will see what I write, because my report will make public. And uh, you know, coming from a school background, I mean, I taught university for 32 years. I'm, I'm a little older than some of the, the last person who come. I'm 71 years old, so I've been around also. And uh, you can give me a grade. You know? A, B, C, or D, or F when you read the report. So with that, I say thank you very much. Thanks, everybody.